Hey there, Mr. Redder here. Welcome back to another episode of Reddit Podcast Stories, where today, my Karen aunt demands that I pay her $300 Olive Garden bill. I'll start off with saying that I have an aunt on my dad's side of the family. She's 50 and has five kids, ranging from age 20 all the way to 12. She's always been known to be a freeloader and taking advantage of situations and people. One time, me and my dad were planning on going to the drive-in and my dad stupidly told her. She asked if her kids could be included too. I felt upset because this happened every time me and my dad had something fun planned, just me and him. I'm hoping that you get the idea with what I've given you so far. But anyway, last week I wanted to celebrate my little sister for getting her driver's permit and I invited all of our family to go to Olive Garden. By that, I mean all of us who live in the same house. I told everyone to clear their schedules for Friday afternoon because I didn't want anyone to feel left out. Well, that's where I messed up because my dad told my aunt and told her that she could tag along too without telling me. We showed up to Olive Garden at around 4.30 p.m. and I asked for a table for five, me, my dad, my two sisters, and my grandpa. But my dad said that if they could make it a table for 12, I asked why and that's when he told me. I was ticked, especially because my aunt and my little sister have history, but I didn't think much of it because I wasn't expecting what was coming up. We're seated and around 30 minutes later, she shows up with all of her kids. We eventually order and she kept ordering expensive dishes and lots of drinks. I was kind of in awe considering she lives off of food stamps, which I don't shame anyone who does, but she kept ordering like she was Scrooge McDuck on just another Tuesday. The bill eventually comes and I ask for it to be split. She says in such a grating voice, What do you mean split the bill? I thought you were paying for us. That's when it clicked. She only came for the free food. I immediately glared at my dad who started blaming me saying, Why would you offer to pay and then not follow through with it? Maybe because I wasn't expecting to pay for another six people. I ended up asking the waitress how much it would be because I didn't want to ruin the mood and my little sister's accomplishment. The bill came out to $557.87. Excluding what me and my family, my dad, my two sisters, and my grandpa ate, it would be about $243. I outright refused to pay for her and her kids' meals. I felt as because two of them are still kids because I never invited her myself, let alone agreed to pay for her bill. Now my dad is calling me a jerk because he had to pay for it with his credit card. I don't believe I did anything wrong, but that's the reason I'm here. Am I the jerk? Not the jerk. I don't know what's wrong with your dad. He knew you didn't invite her and her kids. He invited them so he can pay for them. OP, that's exactly what I told him. I didn't want to make a scene, which took a lot in me to not do. And she also managed to finesse my dad to let her keep my leftovers. We don't have any food at home. Not the jerk, and I think you and your dad need to have a sit down and a very long conversation about this. OP, we've had plenty. He lets her borrow tons of money and even when he's struggling financially, but never had money for child support. He orders her and her kids pizza while my mom had to bust her tail selling her clothes to be able to buy us a rotisserie chicken. I told him he lets himself be treated as a doormat, but all he ever says is, she's my sister dude, I can't just say no, which I understand but when is it enough? I found out my family is hiding my fiance's affair with my best friend. I, 22 female, need some serious advice on how to navigate this. I found out a week ago that basically my entire family has been helping my fiance, male 23, hide his affair with my best friend, 23 female. I created this account because I honestly have no one else to go to, so my brain figured internet strangers would be best. None of my family and friends have read it, Thank the stars. For extra emotional context, my fiancé and I have been together since we were in the 8th grade, on and off until 2020. We have Richard, my half-brother who's 26, Maria, my half-sister, 27, Angie, my mom who's 56, Peach, my best friend, soon-to-be ex-best friend, and Alex, my fiancé, soon-to-be ex. So a week ago, Alex was taking a shower and he had left his phone on our bed. Both me and my fiancé have an open phone policy, seeing as we both struggled with being cheated on in past relationships. Go figure, seeing my situation. I was packing my suitcase for a family trip that's happening after my rehearsal dinner tomorrow. I heard his phone keep going off. He yelled from our shower if I could mute his phone. I went to go get his phone and I saw that it was Peach calling him. I was curious at first, 
but seeing as she's part of my bridal party, I didn't find it too suspicious. I muted the phone and soon messaged Peach from my own phone. Here's the paraphrase of our conversation. Me. Hey Peach, my fiancé is in the shower right now. What did you need? Peach. Oh, nothing. I just wanted to confirm with him the flowers for your bouquet and aisle. Me. That's weird. I didn't change my mind on any flowers or anything. The florist was contacted last month and everything was paid for already by Tony. Tony is my mom's husband. Peach. Are you sure? I remember him telling me you changed your mind. After that, it was the usual wedding talk after that point. In hindsight, I should have found it very weird that she would call him about six times to confirm a flower choice when she simply could have either texted me or Alex. When Alex got out of the shower, I told him Peach tried calling him about the flowers. I asked him what made him think I changed my mind on the flowers for the wedding. He paused for a bit. I now know he was basically stalling and doing the, oh, I'm thinking face when I asked him. He then said that he thought I had mentioned it in passing during a dinner. I told him that I didn't recall that. He then just shrugged and grabbed his phone and went back into the bathroom. I hate to be one of those people, but for once, my gut actually sunk. I got this really paranoid feeling and I couldn't shake it. I tried to convince myself that it was just my old cheating trauma trying to creep back, yet I just couldn't let this go. Me and Alex had dinner and I pushed through all the way until it was time to go to bed. I pretended to fall asleep first. Me and Alex usually cuddle to fall asleep. When I knew he was in a deep enough sleep, I went to check his phone again. I checked his Instagram, Snapchat, and messages, and I couldn't find anything. I then went to his Facebook Messenger. He had Messenger to communicate with his family overseas. I only saw his main family, and most of the messages were about getting plane tickets to come to the wedding. We were supposed to get married in December with a Winter Wonderland-themed wedding. However, with my previous relationships, I checked his archives on Messenger. That's when the horrific truth came to light. There was a group chat with Peach, Alex, Richard, Angie, and Maria. The group chat was established a year ago where basically Alex and Peach confessed to having an affair to my family. My mom did shame them at first, yet she later asked Alex if he truly loved Peach. Because you can't help who you love. Yeah, great mom. That was super helpful. He said he was absolutely sure and that he also loved me too. Then Maria and Richard offered that he, being Alex, bring up to me having an open relationship. They both are in open relationships and married, and apparently it's working well for them and whatever la-la land they live in. At this point, me and him were already engaged. Alex mentioned to them that it seemed too far deep to try and bring it up. Angie, my mom, even though at this point I hate to even call her that, said that they would cover for Alex and Peach until he felt strong enough to bring up an open relationship to me. As I was reading, all I could think was, how the heck could my family betray me like that? How could Peach betray me like that? We've been friends since kindergarten. We even grew up with Alex. How could she process in her mind to hook up with my fiancé and say that she loves him too? All of this in this disgusting group chat. For Alex to have the nerve to say he loves me as well? For him to know firsthand what it's like to be betrayed like this? I honestly wanted to throw up. However, I was just taking screenshots after screenshots. The more I read down, I found out that Peach took my spot on our previous family trip. I got a really bad stomach bug a while ago that caused me to not go. I can't even begin to imagine what they did on that trip. And the fact my mother was okay with all of this, I think that's what hurts me the most. The fact that she's known for a whole year that my fiancé was cheating on me. That's taking the longest to sit in, I feel. There's even more in the group chat, but these were the major points. I've known for a whole week now. It's been eating me up inside, and I want to explode and go off on all of them. I want to ruin their lives the way they ruined mine. It all hurts so much, and I just really want advice on how to confront them. How do I even begin? What do I say? The anger I feel is so intense that I feel like if I just let it all out, I would look like I'm insane. Please Reddit, anything would help. I'm planning on confronting them tomorrow at our rehearsal dinner. Common questions for my messages. Why are you having the rehearsal dinner this early? Me and Alex agreed on three rehearsal dinners, one for my family and friends, one for when his family and friends are in town, and the last one with our families combined. Does Alex live with me? Yes, I bought the apartment while he was living with his roommates in his dorm. I let him move in because he and his roommates weren't getting along after some friend drama they had. We've been living together for two years now. His name is not on the lease, I've done some slight research, and I will definitely use this to my advantage. We have a cat, 
But after all this, she's staying with me, and I'll fight him tooth and nail for her. My relationship with my mom? It's turmoil and stillness at best. After the emotional and mental trouble she put me through most of my childhood, when I turned 18, she apologized. I thought she was actually sorry, and we were working towards rebuilding a bond. With all of this, I'm not even sure we ever had one to begin with. I'm her affair baby, as I've been called. My mother is a very religious person, and she figured that if she confessed, then she would be saved and redeemed. The opposite happened, and she was kicked out of her church group. Anyone that lives in a small town knows that gossip runs wild. Tony, my mom's husband, forgave her and decided to move to better help their image, I guess. A Redditor pointed out that this incident may be why she hates me. Yet, I can't comprehend how this would be my fault, or why she would even hold on to that grudge for so long. Who paid for the wedding? The wedding was a group effort between myself, Alex, stepdad, aunt, and cousin. My mom handled more of the diplomatic things, invitations, and our gift register, really. Hopefully, this is enough extra information for some folks. I appreciate it all. I'm going to bed soon to prep for tomorrow. I know it will be a long and emotional day, but I know with your guys' support, I'll do fine. I'm hoping I will at least. Update. So I did wind up taking bits and pieces of advice from everyone. Last night, I constantly was going back and forth between going ghost or full-on exploding on everyone. I decided to go a mix of both routes. I sent the screenshots to Alex's parents and explained the whole thing to them. I was honestly expecting them to ignore it or not believe me. However, they called rather quickly. They asked me if I had any hard proof of them cheating besides their confession. I confided in them that I did not. They asked for more screenshots, and I just basically sent them a good chunk of the screenshots. His mother made me feel so awful for sending them. She was sobbing and apologizing for her son. She soon became inconsolable. His father took the phone and asked was there anything his son could do to make it up to me. This early morning, I was offended he asked that. Yet, I saw it from his perspective later. I asked him if I could be frank, and he agreed. I told him that unless his son could shrivel up and disappear, then there wasn't anything he could really say. His father said that he understood. I asked him if they could keep this to themselves until I brought it up to Alex. They said they could, and we ended the call. For a while, I thought throwing up from stress was rare, but it finally happened. Alex heard me, I guess, when I was throwing up, not when I was on the phone. I had stepped outside for the phone call, because he woke up and tried to rub my back. I held my hand up and I cleaned myself. This is around 7 a.m. in the morning. Alex had concern in his voice and asked if I was okay. For once, I actually saw nothing but red, yet I kept my composure. I have no idea why, but I guess that will be my superpower I'll hold on to. I ignored him and just went back to sleep. I woke up at 8 a.m. to start getting ready for the rehearsal dinner. Alex told me he had to get some things done before heading to the restaurant. I told him that was fine and that I'd see him later. Before he left, he said he loved me and this was one of the days he was excited for. I said me too, trying not to have much rage behind it. Once he left, I gathered all of the screenshots. For some people that don't know, you can schedule text messages to be sent out at a certain time. I decided to do this to send it to everyone. Peach's family, our friend groups, his family, as well as mine. I sent it to go at 1.25 p.m. This would be the halfway point of the dinner and people would be dropping off gifts early for us, etc. I gathered the black hole of stress forming in me and headed to the restaurant where it was time. My mother and her husband were already there. My mother hugged me and all I could do was stand there. I did a quick tap hug so she wouldn't get suspicious and we headed inside. Guests started flowing in and everyone was surprisingly on time, besides my grandparents, but they moved slow so I didn't blame them. Once everyone was gathered, Alex went on this whole spiel of how he was so happy everyone could come and that he was excited for his family for the next dinner was supposed to be November 20th. He mentioned how I was the love of his life and how he was so happy our families would mingle and we would be one. I wanted to ask him how dare he say that, but nothing but fake smiles and nods came from me. Peach was basically looking like a clueless dog and smiling right along and clapping for us. To see this happen in real life was truly mind-boggling. The lengths people will go to to have their cake and eat it too. I could barely eat as the stress was getting to me so badly. At the time I said for the messages, people's phones started buzzing and Alex's and Peach's phones were blowing up. I would like to admit that for once, a genuine smile crept on my face. It was like watching an entire kingdom crumble and fall. The horrified faces of Peach and Alex when they looked at me was golden. It's the one highlight I will hold on to from this emotional day. My aunt went ballistic. 
She started calling my mom a cruel, heartless jerk over and over. My mother hurriedly checked her phone and saw that I sent her the screenshots too. She started screaming and becoming irate, saying I was really trying to ruin her life again. As some of you suggested, she still apparently is upset about being caught having an affair and being shunned. My grandparents' reaction hurt her the most because they started screaming at her. My grandmother was trying, with a few of our other guests, to hold my aunt back as she started screaming everything she could. My grandfather was screaming at my mother that he didn't raise her to be like this. At this point, everyone is in screaming and crying hysterics. My other bridesmaids were going off on Peach. I hate to admit it again, but I took great joy in that. My grandfather went on to screaming at Alex. I just started laughing and sobbing. I had so much emotions that I genuinely think my body didn't know what to do anymore. The tears just kept coming. My cousin escorted me outside as fast as she could with Alex chasing us down. He kept screaming my name and begging to talk. Like most of you suggested, he wanted to talk to explain his side. I ignored him and my cousin was pushing him away from her car so that she could get in and drive off. She took me to my aunt's house and told me to stay there and not answer the door for anyone. I didn't and just sat on the floor. That's when I just started bawling. All the emotions I've been kept up for a week, they finally came out. After about another hour, my aunt and my cousin came back home. They hugged me for a good five minutes straight. My aunt caught me up on everything. Apparently, after my cousin drove off with me, Alex came back in and started screaming at Peach for ruining everything. They got into a screaming match and some of our friends were trying to split them apart. My grandparents, aunt and Tony, my mom's husband, were drilling into my mother for answers. Tony was the most livid. Apparently, during the family trip I couldn't go to, my mom told Tony that I had offered my ticket to Peach so she could enjoy a nice break for herself. Tony at this point was screaming and reading some of her messages out loud. She was begging him to stop and saying she could explain. My aunt started adding on that she better start explaining because all she sees is a worthless mother and a vile person. Apparently, this set my mother off and she started screaming about how she hated me, about how I ruined her life and made it difficult. How she felt like she could never be happy because I was always a constant reminder of her biggest mistake ever and she regretted having me. That set my aunt off and she basically pounced on her. For context, my aunt is infertile. In her words, I was the daughter she never got to have. So in her mind, she went full mama bear mode on my birth giver. That's what I'm calling her now. My aunt has been more of a mother to me than my mother ever has been in the past 22 years of my life. To make a long list short here, here's everything that happened. Tony is divorcing my mom. He's had suspicions for a few months that she's cheating again. Peach exposed Alex's text to her that the reason he was hooking up with her was because he felt I was growing distant a while back. I was putting in overtime at work to save up for his birthday and that he was lonely and didn't know how to bring it up to me. Peach's father spammed her with calls and will be cutting her off financially. Apparently, this is my fault and I'm an evil jerk for ruining her according to her texts. My mother has been on a tirade with our family, exclaiming I'm an evil person for destroying her world again. Should have thought about that before condoning anything. Half-siblings felt it wasn't their place to say anything to me, and that I should have expected Alex to look elsewhere because humans aren't monogamous, and people love who they love. Same old, same old. A lot more has happened, but to avoid my brain from imploding on itself from the stress and anger, it's finally out in the air. I've been getting texts and calls from everyone, but at the moment, I've left my phone in the other room. I'm updating this from my aunt's computer. My aunt offered for me to stay with her until I get back out of this jumbled mess. I accepted it, saying as I have no intention of going back to that apartment. I've already emailed my landlord and will be handling it all next week. My boss emailed me back and said I was allowed to use some paid time off for as long as I need. I will definitely take it, saying as I'm highly considering moving somewhere else quiet and peaceful. I'm thinking maybe Iowa, or maybe even North Carolina. I've heard they have good cost of living in those states. Am I the jerk for telling my sister-in-law she's no longer invited to our house? I, female 27, and my husband, male 27, got married a year back. We had been dating for 10 years, and most of his family knew about us. I went to his sister's wedding because I was invited, and it was a nice experience. I've grown up to be very social and career-oriented and really value education. My husband is the same, and that's how we really connected with each other. My sister-in-law, however, has a different mindset. She got married at a very young age and chose to have a family. She has one daughter and chose to not pursue a college degree. 
However, she's a total brat and has always been told yes for everything. For context, she had a three-day wedding in Italy with 120 guests. She doesn't hate me but doesn't love me either and the feelings are mutual. We just don't connect. We recently bought a new house and threw a housewarming for all of his family and everyone loved the house. We have an extra guest bedroom, just in case. His sister absolutely loved the house, which she said like 50 times, and said she would move some of her daughter's stuff here in the extra room because we have too much space and she doesn't want to carry it whenever she comes. We live in New York and she comes from New Mexico. I really didn't get the logic and politely declined and said we have a lot of guests coming every now and then and we don't have spare space for your daughter's clothes or toys. She wasn't happy, but I didn't care. It's been four months since we bought the house, and she's come a total of 53 days. Yes, I counted. Most of the time, she comes unannounced and says, I was visiting someone, or I was in the neighborhood. What kind of person would fly from New Mexico to New York to be in the neighborhood? Anyway, slowly I realized she had started putting up pictures and redecorating our guest bedroom, and I lost it. I told my husband and he said I'm overthinking and she's just trying to be friends with me. When she left last week, I packed a box of all of her belongings, which she very conveniently forgets, in our guest bedroom and I shipped it to her place. She got very angry and called me and started screaming at me. I told her to stop overreacting and stop considering our house as hers and that she's no longer welcome. I told my husband everything and that I would not entertain her anymore. He agreed to what I said and told his sister that she needs to stop doing this or she's no longer welcome. She called my in-laws and literally every person we know and told them that we were being jerks. Our phones have been buzzing with texts and calls saying how inconsiderate we are and that what we did was wrong. I told everyone, if you're so interested, keep her in your house and stop bothering me. Am I the jerk? Edit. I see a lot of people writing that she's running from a bad husband. She's not. She got married at 17 because she was pregnant with her daughter and got divorced three years later. She lives with her parents in a five-bedroom townhouse with no job. She loves the idea of living in New York. I think shipping her stuff that she forgot was brilliant. Not the jerk because her showing up without advance notice isn't okay, but you and your spouse should probably chat and get on the same page for boundaries with the family. My mother-in-law photoshopped my husband's nose on our wedding pictures. How do I tell him? I, 27 female, have been with my husband, who's 29, male, for 7 years. I remember that early in our relationship, one of the first things he expressed insecurity about was his nose. Specifically about its width. He never wanted surgery, but thinks his nose is too big for his face. I never thought that true, and for a long time I wondered where he had gotten that idea from. Then I met his mother and all my doubts went out the window. I don't hate her, but the woman complains about everything, and she seems particularly interested in criticizing her sons. Barely anything about my husband or his older brother is good enough for her, and if it is, she's quick to imply that they don't deserve it. According to my brother-in-law, that behavior didn't start until father-in-law passed away, about eight years ago, so they don't usually hold it against her. But to me, it seems like she legitimately doesn't want her kids to be happy. Most times we talk to her, my husband ends up devastated. She constantly complains about me, his job, our apartment, and his appearance. She has, on more than one occasion, suggested that he get a nose job. That tends to upset him, so I always try to shut that down as quickly as possible. We got married in early May. The photos were ready in about two months later, and we created a shared album on Google Photos for our friends and family, including mother-in-law. I got pregnant during our honeymoon, and I'm now 24 weeks along. We've had problems with mother-in-law concerning my pregnancy. We're having a boy and she had a breakdown because she wanted a girl and that forced us to put her on an info diet. This was two months ago and she has since improved her behavior. Because of that, we said yes when she invited us to go to a mall near her place to shop for baby clothes last Saturday. My husband had an emergency at work and ended up not coming along, but we still managed to have a good time. When we were done, she invited me back to her place. I hadn't been there in a while and I quickly saw that she had gotten some of our wedding pictures up on the wall. I instantly noticed something was wrong with them, but I couldn't pinpoint what it was yet. Mother-in-law saw what I was looking at and proudly announced that she had gotten someone to fix his nose. In other words, she gave her son a Photoshop nose job on his wedding pictures. I couldn't believe it. I never thought that she'd stoop so low. It wasn't even a good nose job. It was so bad that my husband's face didn't look real. 
He looked like a Ken doll, and not in the hot Ryan Gosling way. Mother-in-law must have seen how mad I got because she instantly tried to defend herself. She tried to make the point that her son deserved to look his best on his wedding day, and I should have convinced him to get the real nose job before our ceremony. I made up an excuse to leave, but I could tell that she knew the real reason. She's been calling and texting me almost every day since. I've been ignoring her, but she's always either apologizing, accusing me of overreacting, or begging me not to tell my husband. I know it seems trivial, but I'm outraged, and the more I think about it, the more disgusted I get. I could never imagine doing something like that to my kid. I haven't told my husband yet, mostly because we've both been busy with work this week, but also because I have no idea how to. His mother was finally starting to be a better person around him and his brother, and I know it will break his heart to find out about this. I don't know what to do. I have to tell him, but I can't figure out how. I know he loves his mother, and I don't want to damage whatever relationship they still have. Mother-in-law also mentioned she intended to send the improved pictures to some of her relatives, so I have to find a way to shut that down. So how can I tell my husband his mother photoshopped his face on our wedding pictures? More importantly, what would be the most peaceful way to do it? I would suggest that you sit your husband down and say that something came up when you were out with his mom that you need to tell him about. Tell him that you went back to her place and saw she had printed up wedding photos, but that she had photoshopped his face to change his appearance. Keep it short and don't beat around the bush. Then just be supportive and let him react however he's going to. I really don't understand why his mom would tell you not to say anything. Does she not realize that at some point he'd see the pictures himself? OP, I don't get it either. I've spoken to a couple of friends about it, and so far our best theory is that she didn't think the Photoshop was that obvious until I was able to point it out. That still barely makes any sense, and I have no idea what she was thinking. My Karen girlfriend refuses to pay her share of the rent. My girlfriend and I have been dating for a year, and we want to move in together. We want a two-bedroom, one-bath apartment or a townhouse near my work. I'm a second-year pathology resident, and my residency is five years long. She works from home and wants an office. She also makes $120,000 a year, and I only make $68,000 a year. So our rent is $1,800 a month plus utilities, and she wants to go half on both rent and utilities, so we would both pay roughly $1,000 a month. Because she's using one of the rooms as her office, I feel like she should pay more, so I should pay $700, and she should be paying $1,300. She thinks even if she is using the extra room, because living near the hospital is very expensive, I should pay half, because we could get a cheaper place if I don't live near work. She thinks it's because we're paying more to live near my work, so I don't have to pay for gas, I should pay half for rent. I find she's being selfish, because she makes much more than me, and once I complete my residency, I can easily make $350,000 a year or more. But according to her, it's not fair for her to have to wait three years to potentially get paid back, because we could break up, and she would have subsidized me. To me, if she isn't willing to pay a bit more to put some skin in the game, she's being a gold digger and waiting for me to make bank without giving anything in the first place. We argued about this a few times, and I just want to know if I'm crazy in my thinking or if she's the one being selfish. You're the jerk. You're not married. You should be splitting rent 50-50. Also, in this situation, you're the gold digger. You're the jerk. And she's absolutely right that it's unfair to wait three years to potentially get paid back because you're not guaranteed that salary. Also, calling her a gold digger while also wanting her to pay more? She's asking you to pay half while she pays half. The only one asking someone to pay more than half is you. Who's the gold digger? You're the jerk. She makes nearly twice what you make now, but she's a gold digger? You're the jerk, purely because you think that she's a gold digger. You're living near the hospital for your needs, and okay, she's worked from home, but it's not like she's choosing to live in her ideal neighborhood in a McMansion. You're making assumptions when she's trying to make a clear-cut equal partnership while you'll carry forward. Because you played this game, you'll lose in the long run. Because that 70-30 split in her favor looks real different when you make three times what you do now. You're the jerk. Oh look, another lazy guy trying to get his girlfriend to pay more than him for their rent. What a surprise. If there's one thing I've learned on Reddit, it's that I will never try to date any of these dudes nowadays. Sure, I will meet guys on dating apps just to have a little fun every now and then, but when it comes to actually giving them a chance at a real relationship, no thanks. As soon as guys start talking about having a relationship with me, I straight up ghost them. My fur babies are all I need for a happy life. Loser guys, no thank you. 
not the jerk. I'll get downvoted to heck for this, but once again, this is the double standard we see here on Reddit. If the roles were flipped and you were the one who made three times her salary, and you were the one who would be using the second bedroom as an office, all these commenters would be saying, of course you should be paying more than her in rent. But because you're a dude, everyone here just wants to crap all over you. And they wonder why so many of us are losing our minds. Then when we do speak up about how we're treated, they only mock us even more for speaking up about it and call us names. I hope one day things can change, but honestly, I don't have much hope anymore. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or his girlfriend? Please let us know. The funny thing is, we've read stories very similar to this one, and the commenters said the opposite, but of course the roles were flipped. Maybe that last commenter was onto something. My husband's parents took out credit cards in his name. My husband ran a credit report and found out that his credit score was 450. Needless to say, we were shocked. We had no idea how his credit score had gotten so low. We looked at the details, and lo and behold, 13 credit cards had been taken out in his name with debts that amounted to $10,000 by you guessed it, mother-in-law. He called mother-in-law on the phone and she admitted to taking out the credit cards in his name and racking up the debt. I don't even know what else to type because I'm literally floored. I have no idea what to do, think, say, anything. I feel so bad and just like I need so much help. Update. So we found out that they've been doing this for the past six years. They're only making the minimum payments on them. He was able to get access to the accounts online because his mom uses the same password for everything. The accounts were being paid from their bank account. The credit cards had been used for things like gas, gifts, phone bills, hospital bills, Etsy, etc. Let me start this off by saying his dad makes about $100,000 a year, but they live well above their means. We confronted his parents on the phone and they admitted that they took out the credit cards in his name. They said they didn't have enough money to pay all of the credit cards back right now, but they would start paying $800 a month on them starting in October instead of the minimum that they were doing before, $26 per month per card. Husband doesn't want his parents to go to jail for identity theft, but I don't feel comfortable being at their mercy regarding whether or not they pay. We're also worried that we might not have enough evidence or that they could just say that all of the credit cards were his or that he knew about them. Husband really doesn't want to take them to court, but I'm not sure what options we have. I feel like it might be important to note that his parents don't like us and never want to speak to us again, so we don't really have any reason to trust what they're saying, except for the fact that they've been paying on them for six years. I'm really just looking for advice on what different options we have, what those would entail, whether or not we would have to file criminal charges to get the money from them, etc. Edit. Husband's parents still have his social security number memorized and even pulled up a credit report on their own in his name last night. Is there anything we can do about this? Husband suggested legally changing his name, but I'm not sure that would work. The only options you have are to agree to allow your husband's parents to pay down the debt at a pace that they can, or you have to file a police report for identity theft and sue in small claims court for the financial ramifications. You have no other options here. It will not be easy for them to get out of this, but it will be fairly easy for you to show that you never took these credit cards out, and they are the ones who abused them. Update. After we found out about what was going on, we called his parents to see what they would have to say, and it really hit the fan. I probably shouldn't have talked to them at all, because at that point I was fuming, but we really felt like we needed some answers to what was going on. I will admit that I yelled at them and said some very not nice, a bit of an understatement, things on the phone. We started the conversation talking about the debt, and we barely said three sentences about it before they turned the whole thing around. The conversation went on for 30 minutes. Halfway through, which husband had a panic attack, and only about two minutes actually consisted of them talking about the fact that they had racked up all of the debt and stolen his identity. I'll add some of the highlights of the conversation. The money is not the issue. The real issue is your wife. Ever since you married Batman, no one wants to be around you. If she was a good wife, she would want you to be around your family. She's a bad wife because she's filling your head with lies about us. At this point, I mentioned how they were mistreating us with the words they were saying. What? You're making that up. Where did you get that from? You're crazy. You will not be able to go to your grandparents' funerals because of your wife. His grandparents are in great health, by the way. Your mother has done nothing but love you, and she gets treated this way? They went on and on for 30 minutes, during which I'll admit that I yelled at them quite a bit and lost my temper, mostly because I was mad that all they were doing was talking about me, and not the fact that they stole his identity. I ended the conversation by saying, we just need to know a few things. 
One, did you take out the credit cards? Yes. Two, are you going to pay them back? Yes. How are you going to do that? My car gets paid off in October, so I'll pay $800 a month starting then. Husband really doesn't want to press charges against them, but I have no reason to believe that they will pay the money back, except for the fact that they said they would. One big thing that I'm worried about is that last night, they pulled up a credit report for husband on their own, meaning they have all of the access to his financial information at their fingertips and they're willing to use it. This whole thing just feels like I'm living in a nightmare. Edit to add, husband and I are filing a police report for identity theft. I think the thing some of you said really got through to him. We're filing the police report when he gets off work, then going to the bank to change accounts to one that she does not know and getting him a new phone number. We are 100% no contact with them and letting the police deal with it now. I'm hoping that husband stays true to his word and I have faith that he will. At this point, I'm terrified that they're going to do something to us after they've found out that we've gone to the police. I feel like I don't know what they're capable of anymore. I'm really just scared. Update. I'm really starting to wonder if we're doing the right thing. We went to the police station last night and filed a police report. It was honestly just awful. The officer kept talking to us, trying to talk us out of it, saying that if we did it, his mother would be going to prison. This isn't a direct quote, but he said something like, This isn't just a tool to get this stuff off of your record. This will put criminal charges against her. Husband and I kind of just looked at each other, but in the end, we went through with the police report. I felt nothing but sick since we found out about all of this. Now I'm starting to feel like we shouldn't have gone through with the police report. His parents are texting him, saying that they have the money and that they're going to pay back all of the accounts now and that if we go through with the charges, they're going to prison and they're losing their jobs. I don't even know if we could retract the police report if we wanted to. I know that this identity theft case is going to be a huge stressor in our lives and connect us to his parents even longer. I'm sure they're going to try to say that my husband knew about the accounts and that he gave them permission, and I'm starting to worry that people will listen to them. We called the credit card companies to report the fraud, and they told us the charges, and a lot of them were things that were gifts to my husband, along with bills and other things. I'm worried that because husband benefited from the fraud because his parents bought things for him, they will use that in court against us and say that husband knew and gave them permission. One of the charges was for tires for husband's car that they gifted to him. He dropped the car off at the dealer and picked it up. His mom went in to pay, but he was the one who dropped it off. I'm just so worried that they're going to lie to turn this against husband and that someone will believe them. We really don't have much proof except what's on the cards and that they were the ones making the payments. We live in a state where we can't record phone conversations, so we can't try to get them to admit it. I'm starting to regret all of this. I wish we could just go back to Saturday when we had no idea about any of it and we were happy. I'm feeling so miserable and depressed and I can't get out of this funk. We absolutely cannot afford to go to therapy right now in case husband gets put on the hook for all these charges, but I don't know what to do to make either of us feel better. Update. It's been about eight months since my last update. A lot has happened since then and I felt like those of you who helped me out deserved an update. Since then, we've done a lot of fighting with the in-laws. We decided against filing charges and instead hired a lawyer. The lawyer wrote up some legal documents I don't understand, which basically stated that they had until March 2017 to pay off the debt, plus the fees for our lawyer. They agreed to it, probably because they didn't want to go to jail and thought that they could still salvage a relationship with their son. Since then, they have paid back all of the money, most of it with large sums of money, which makes me wonder why they needed the cards in the first place, and my husband's credit has increased quite a bit. My husband made the decision that he no longer wanted a relationship with his parents, which I supported him with wholeheartedly. Our decision was to never see or speak to his family again, but when my husband's niece passed, their granddaughter, we felt as though we should at least go to the funeral. We saw them there, and they started acting like nothing had happened and that everything was okay. We let them have their moment due to what had happened. They have invited us to various holidays since then, but we have not responded. We haven't seen them since the funeral and don't plan on seeing them again. I'm not sure what my husband would decide to do in the event of another funeral, but we'll cross that bridge when we get there. I want to thank everyone for all your support and helping me and my husband get through one of the most difficult times of our lives. Everything is exponentially better now, and I'm so happy that we decided to go no contact. 10 for 10 would do again. Am I the jerk for demanding my coworker pay me for a ride to work after many months of giving her a free ride? For the last 14 months, I've been driving one of my coworkers to and from work. She lives only a mile up the road from me and it's convenient since it's on my way, so I've never asked her for money or accepted it when offered. 
From my perspective, I would be going there regardless, and her overall household expenses are higher than mine, so it felt like the right thing to do. Over the weekend, my car went to the shop. I informed my coworker that I wouldn't be available to give her a ride on Monday or Tuesday. She said it wasn't a problem because her boyfriend is off this week and would give her a ride. I asked if I could also catch a ride with them and even offered to walk to her home so they wouldn't have to drive out of their way. She consulted with her boyfriend and he agreed but requested $20 for the two days. I understand it's just $20 but that request bothered me. I declined the offer and mentioned that I would find my own transportation. At work yesterday, she inquired about my car. I informed her that I would be getting my car back on Tuesday night but going forward, if she wanted to ride with me, I would appreciate $30 a week, which covers about a third of my gas costs. She was upset by this and mentioned that her boyfriend had asked for money from me because having me in the car meant he couldn't make any stops on the way home. I pointed out that I had been willing to drive straight home to help her out for over a year and it wouldn't have hurt him to show some level of appreciation. Today, she informed me that she would no longer be riding with me after discussing it with her boyfriend. She expressed disappointment with me for holding his actions against her and accused me of being petty. A couple of other coworkers mentioned throughout the day that her boyfriend is simply unpleasant and that she doesn't have much say at home, but overall, they agreed with me that his behavior was inconsiderate. From my perspective, this guy directly benefits from me by not having to worry about transportation for his girlfriend or spending any money on travel, and my coworker should have stood up for me. Do you think I'm being petty about this? Petty? Yes. Jerk, no. While she can blame her boyfriend, she went along with it. She should have explained to him how for over a year, you gave her free rides and asking for money was tacky of him. But she didn't. She just went along with it. She showed you what she thought of your kindness and friendship. You're just showing her the same. Not the jerk. Not the jerk. She's a package deal with her boyfriend. You were doing her a favor for quite some time and you're right that she should have defended you against her boyfriend. Heck, she could even pay him those $20 for you. How come she was upset only after you wanted money from her and not when her boyfriend asked for money from you if in her book it's okay to ask for money? Your offer of one third of the cost was pretty generous. She had free rides. She tanked the possibility for herself over a measly $20. Not the sharpest tool in the shed. Today I messed up by losing my job $4,000 in inventory. I'm 16 and I've been working as a cashier at a nearby supermarket for the past six months so I'm still relatively new to some things. During the peak of our rush hour yesterday afternoon, two women arrived at the front of my line with carts full of expensive merchandise. Right from the start, I noticed that they were very talkative as I scanned their items, asking me numerous questions about myself, my life, and my job. It almost felt like a distraction. At the time, I didn't find it too strange since customers often strike up conversations like that. They shared details about their lives as traveling nurses, and one of them mentioned having worked as a cashier at a similar place to where I work. The first woman's total came to around $2,600, all for items like baby monitors, a pump, and other baby supplies. I was taken aback by the amount because I hadn't realized how quickly it had added up. It was the first time I had seen a purchase of this magnitude. Now, here's where it gets interesting. At the end of the first woman's total, she showed me a store credit card with instructions on the back that read, Insert card, then select cash tender. I started feeling suspicious at this point, but the card looked very real, so I allowed it. She was also quite convincing, explaining how the card worked and that it was a privilege earned by people with excellent credit. So I followed her instructions. I pressed the button indicating that she paid in cash, handed her the receipt, and then it was the next woman's turn. She also had a similar cart filled with items totaling around $1,300. I admit by that point I should have caught on, and to be honest, I feel like an idiot. She handed me a card identical to her friend's with the same instructions to select cash. I pressed the same button, but since they didn't actually give me any cash, I didn't put anything in the register. It wasn't until later in the day that I discovered neither of their cards worked because I hadn't pressed card tender on the machine. Their act of inserting the cards was a simple trick, so off they went with all that merchandise in their carts, a receipt in hand, and not a single dollar spent. About half an hour later, I consulted my manager and was informed that it was definitely a scam. Honestly, I'm still shocked that I fell for it so badly. They knew exactly how to respond to every question, having a ready-made explanation for each item. They even mentioned a baby shower in relation to some of the items, although I don't recall all of their excuses. It was very well put together, I must admit, looking back. I should have noticed the signs earlier, but the pressure from the long line of customers behind them got to me. I fell for the change scam once. 
Guy handed me a $100 bill for a small purchase, talking to me while I'm counting out his change. Leaves and comes back, asking if he can switch it out as he wants to keep the $100 bill. Got me just the right kind of confused that he got the $80 change and the original $100 bill back, and I didn't even notice anything wrong until I went to count the drawer later. Manager wasn't mad at me, but just found it on the camera and showed me what happened so I knew what to look for next time. Really surreal seeing myself do that without realizing anything wrong. I, 32 female, purposefully ignored what my husband told me he wanted for Father's Day, now he's ignoring me. My husband and I have been together for the past 9 years and we have two kids, an 8 year old and a 6 year old. On Mother's Day, all I wanted was a day to myself. I asked my husband to take the kids out somewhere so I could have some time alone to relax. Instead, he surprised me and the kids with tickets for a fun day out. We had a great time and the kids enjoyed it, but it bothered me that he gave me the opposite of what I had asked for. For Father's Day, my husband wanted a day to himself to stay home and play video games. He often games with his friends, spending a few hours in his office after work. So instead of giving him a free day, I got him and the kids cards for an arcade an hour away, with plenty of tokens. I gave him the cards during dinner on Saturday so they could leave early and spend the whole day playing together. I got my desired free day and my husband and the kids made lasting memories. However, after the kids went to bed, my husband and I got into a fight. He was upset that I disregarded his wish for Father's Day while I was angry that he didn't realize he had done the same thing to me on Mother's Day. Since then, he has been ignoring me and not accepting my apologies. Edit. Some people seem to think that my husband, kids, and I went out together on Mother's Day. However, that's not the case. I took the kids out for a day out while he spent the entire day playing video games with his friends. Edit. I can't believe I have to clarify this, but I don't resent my kids. My point was not that spending a day out with them is terrible and that I don't want to do it. My point was that it's disappointing when you ask for one thing and receive the opposite. Based on your edit, it sounds like you each got your gifts, just on the other's holiday. If he really can't see how these things are the same, I suggest you speak in smaller words and try again, because he's being deliberately obtuse. He expected to have a day off on Mother's Day and another on Father's Day, and is being a petty kid that he didn't get both days off. Make a graph and chart which days each of you has off. When you're alone with him, hold it up, tell him to explain how it's different, with facts and logic. Ask if the difference was that he was happy on Mother's Day and unhappy on Father's Day. Once you're able to get him talking, you're also going to have to discuss how it's not appropriate to give your spouse the silent treatment, on top of the not-coolness of him acting like he's the only human being with feelings that matter in your marriage. There's no way he didn't know what he was doing when he set up a day with you and the kids on Mother's Day without him around, or I guess maybe he's legitimately insane. I feel crazy reading these comments accusing you of resenting your kids or being a bad wife or being petty. Like, yeah, it was petty. People get petty when they're mistreated and taken advantage of. And now he's lying to you and saying it's not the same and not what he was trying to do. Please. Any husband with half a brain knows that Mother's Day is a holiday the father slash husband participates in actively. Not just planning or buying, but is present with you, with the kids, trying to give you time off. It's what he wanted for Father's Day. He knew it's what you wanted for Mother's Day. Yeah, it was petty. I would be petty too if my partner got me an obligation and got themselves a day of rest. You two need to talk it out, but he needs to own up to what he did. Am I the jerk for telling my girlfriend her home decor is the reason I won't host a work gathering at her place? I, male 32, have been with my girlfriend, who's 29, for over a year now. She's smart, funny, a bit quirky, and has a serious job with a good salary. We have a great time together and generally get along very well. The only thing is her choice in home decor is bizarre, to put it frankly, and not something you would think a normal, grown adult would be into. Her apartment is definitely a reflection of herself and her interests, but not in the best way. My girlfriend has a wall dedicated to animation in one room of her apartment, with Futurama pieces and etchings of some weird triangle guy. Then there's the wall of framed and preserved insects in another room. But not insects like butterflies or moths. Instead, she displays tarantulas, beetles, and large stick insects. Her bathroom has a subtle theme of the ocean, which is pretty common, but instead of starfish or shells, she has a little anglerfish nightlight, a small vampire squid painting, and a framed diagram of what apparently is a goblin shark right by the toilet. I would say a majority of her home decor and furnishings are okay. The apartment itself is very modern and sleek. It's just the random decor and juvenile-ish themes like cartoons, insects, and bizarre ocean creatures that are off-putting. This is where I might be the jerk. 
I avoid bringing people over to her place, especially people from my job, because of how juvenile it looks. Everyone's impressed when they see the high rise, but that quickly fades once you enter. The one time I brought a work colleague over, they ended up telling me afterward that they found her insect wall terrifying. I work in finance, and appearances and first impressions are important. My office holds casual gatherings where we get together for a few drinks and good food, and we rotate hosts. This time, it's my turn. The problem is, my place is under some construction and not an ideal place to be right now, so I've been staying with my girlfriend. She suggested that we host my colleagues here since she has the space and thinks it'll be fun. I told her I planned on skipping my rotation and seeing if the next person would be okay with hosting early. She kept pressing on why I didn't want them over here, so I finally said it's because her home decor is strange and not something a grown woman should have, and also that her insect wall horrified the one colleague that did come over. My girlfriend got mad and said that at the end of the day, it's not my space and these things bring her joy. She also said that she is indeed an adult, which is exactly why her apartment is decorated in such a manner. I love my girlfriend, I do, and it's okay to have different interests, but does an adult really need to decorate with them besides a few things here and there? I mean, my own mother was confused after she saw the entire apartment for the first time. So Reddit, am I the jerk for telling my girlfriend her home decor is the reason I won't host a work gathering in her place? You're the jerk. So you don't like her interests? You don't have to be judgmental about it. Your one and only experience bringing someone over, they were terrified of the insect display. So this one person and your own distaste has convinced you that everyone would be terrified? You don't need to bring your work colleagues over, but if you yourself look down on your girlfriend because of her interests and how she chooses to decorate, maybe you shouldn't be with her. Yeah, you don't really love her. If you did, you would rejoice in these fantastic examples of her quirkiness. She sounds great. You're the jerk because you're pretending to love this woman, but you secretly look down on her and feel superior. Break up with her and let her find someone who will cherish her awesomeness. I can't stand people who gatekeep adulthood. They're stuffy and boring and have no sense of whimsy. Why do people have to give up the stuff they enjoy just because they reach an arbitrary age that makes them an adult? That's BS. Love what you love and celebrate it until the day you pass. Loss Prevention wants us to put in service calls. I work for a printing company, and as I tell a lot of people, much of my job is literally malicious compliance. People wanting things printed, despite how they look, spelling and design errors, and just being plain ugly. This is another story that's come up these past two weeks. A while ago, one of our other locations absolutely destroyed one of their printers. Toner everywhere. The finisher unit was a hunk of plastic and metal. I genuinely don't know what they did to the machine, but it was foobar based on the photo, especially since the toner cartridge is not in the finisher unit. An investigation took place and it was discovered that rather than calling in printer technicians to repair the machines, some of the company employees were repairing them instead. A company-wide message went out essentially telling everyone not to repair or perform maintenance on the machine ourselves. Genuinely common sense things that had to be put on paper because someone did something stupid. We were always supposed to put in service calls to the techs to come take care of the machines or we will be brought to HR. Three months later, last week. Two guys from Loss Prevention, who we'll call Tweedledum and Tweedledumer, came in to do a regular check-in. Everything was going great until I needed to change the paper in one of the printers. Tweedledum approached me and basically began raking me over the coals, saying that only technicians can open the machines. Of course, I'm dumbfounded because all I'm doing is changing the paper, but I just shrug and say, sorry, won't happen again. Well, the next day I was brought into a meeting with HR over a video call, basically wagging their finger at me. My boss, D, took the fall for me and said he was the one who told me to change the paper, so I got off scot-free and D only got a slap on the wrist. However, as a result of this, the whole facility went into malicious compliance mode after that meeting. Need to change out the paper trays? Service call. Paper jam? Better put in a service call. Need to change the toner? That's a service call. Our output of jobs last week was absolutely in the toilet. Machines were down for nearly 90% of the shifts. The techs were having a field day, however, as they got paid per call they took. While our backlog is through the roof, we were able to make our point eventually. I'm not sure exactly what had been happening in the background, but today I received a handwritten apology from Tweedledum and Tweedledumer with a $50 Visa gift card, saying they didn't understand what our job required when they reprimanded me and referred me to HR. We're back at full capacity now and have a huge backlog to catch up on. I'm hoping in addition to this gift card, I can also get in some approved overtime for some extra spending money for an upcoming trip that I have planned. 
The company I work for may be dim at times, but at least they often admit when they make a mistake. My annoying girlfriend records us eating dinner to post on social media. My girlfriend, who's 33, and I, 26 male, have been together for about two months. I'll give it a bit of backstory. My girlfriend is an absolute gym shark and has a pretty good fit as she works out really early in the morning every day. She also records these workouts and posts them on her social media. She has a whopping amount of followers for being a relatively normal person, meaning she's not a celebrity. About 130,000 followers to be exact. Most of her videos are usually thirsty guys complimenting her, but I bite my tongue because she's with me. She also records lots of videos with me and takes lots of pictures with me and posts them on her social media too. She loves making dancing videos with me too, which I fail at horribly. Now back to the story. We went to a pretty nice restaurant and she started taking videos and pictures of me and the food. I didn't mind, but it was getting annoying, so I told her to put her phone away. She said no, and when our entrees got to the table, she started recording live. I told her quietly to turn it off as I didn't want to be eating in front of people live. She laughed, thinking I was joking, and I said I was serious. She scoffed and said no. I put her phone with the camera facing down and told her that I didn't like being recorded while eating and told her it was annoying. She said she didn't care and told me it's her social media and she can do whatever she wants. I got frustrated and told her that it's annoying and that nobody cares what she's eating. She argued with me that it wasn't true and showed me how many views she had. I told her it was just a bunch of thirsty guys. She said that wasn't true and ignored me. She decided to just record herself eating and we finished dinner without talking and she was pretty upset. I think I took it too far, but she was being annoying. Am I the jerk? Not the jerk. Sure, it may be just her social media, but the relationship belongs to both of you. If she can't even be present with you and is instead looking at everything as a potential viral video, that isn't fair to either of you or the health of the relationship. I'm not usually one for ultimatums, but this situation may just call for one. You're the jerk. You sound really insecure. Thirsty guys? What, so you think she can't have actual fans just because she's attractive? Plenty of guys would give anything to be with a fitness celebrity, which is pretty much what your girlfriend is at this point. And instead of encouraging her and being supportive, you let your own insecurities get in the way and you're trying to hold her back. I hope she finds a guy who is secure in himself and who supports her. You should really stop being so controlling. You totally give me creeper vibes like my ex did. He didn't even want me going to the movies with a guy friend because he was so insecure. Like, look, dude, I don't care what kind of issues you have from your past, but there's no way I'm letting you take it out on me. So yeah, I'm not proud of it, but in the end, I did cheat on him just to hurt him. That's what happens when you're an insecure little guy wasting the time of a grown woman like me. Take me as I am, or you'll miss me when I'm gone. <laughs> Don't mess with an engineer. I worked for a company that provides specialized equipment used in manufacturing. To protect my anonymity, I'll have to be vague about what exactly this machine does. During my time working in this field, I got to know many clients who would need these machines installed and serviced. One of these customers we'll call Jake. I later left the company for a different job, but Jake apparently kept my number. One afternoon, I got a call from Jake that they wanted a new unit installed and another unit needed maintenance and wanted to know if I was available. I let him know that I left the company, but that I could pass him on to someone who could help. He tells me he'll pay me two times my current rate to install the unit over the weekend. He lets me know that the company has increased the rates of installation and the company just can't afford it. The instructions they sent over just aren't clear enough and their engineers are scratching their heads trying to figure it out. He begs me to consider it and I agree. For more context, installing this unit can take a good few hours or up to a day on your own. The company gives you two options. You can either pay for an engineer to come and install it or you can save money and they will send instructions so the customer's own engineer can install it. The instructions aren't easy to follow and it's company policy that if someone has started to install the equipment, the supplier wouldn't get involved since they couldn't verify that any of the pieces were broken. This will be important later. I drive down on the weekend and they show me the boxes of equipment. I set to work and I make good progress installing the unit. Around six hours in and I'm stopped by Jake who greets me. I let him know I'm nearly finished and he tells me, sorry, but they just don't have the budget to pay you. He understands my frustration, but his engineers can take it from here. To say I was frustrated was an understatement. I wanted revenge. There's a small button inside the unit that changes the unit into test mode. 
This is done to perform maintenance on the unit, but it's impossible to configure the unit with the button pressed. It's only possible to reach this button using a pin, so it's not easily pressed during installation. Because of this, the installation instructions don't mention it. There's really no way of telling the equipment is in test mode, it just won't work normally. I think you can guess where this is going. I click the button, collect my things and leave. Monday morning I get a call from Jake. I declined. I knew my old company wouldn't get involved since I already started installing the unit. I knew his engineers would never figure it out. I just had to let him stew. A few days later, with many missed calls, I finally pick up. Jake is furious. He asks me where the heck I've been and why I haven't been picking up my phone. He tells me they can't figure it out how to configure the machine and they need my help. I tell him, why is this my problem? You won't pay me. He told me he was sorry and they would work something out if I could get there as soon as possible. I told him, oh no, you're going to pay me 7,000 pounds up front before I do anything. I never felt this powerful before. He screamed at me for a bit and hung up. He called back a day later after saying that he's sorry for how he acted and said that if I could come fix it, he would pay me, in a totally defeated tone. He tried to fight it, saying he'll pay me when I was done, but I was having none of it. After a bit of back and forth, he agrees to pay me. The money hit my account and I came in the next day. The look of confusion over his face when I took out a pin and changed the unit from test mode was priceless. It was even more priceless seeing his reaction to me packing up my tools and leaving after only 20 minutes of configuring. Easiest 7,000 pounds I'd ever made. Don't try to mess with a professional problem solver. I caught my Karen sister trying to steal from me. I, 27 female, and my sister, 30 female, have a really strained relationship. I'm very low contact with her and she only contacts me either to get money or to ask me to buy stuff for her kids. Me and my husband are very well off and we own a business together. So over time, with some of my fun money, I've bought designer handbags, and soon enough, I had a collection. So when we bought our house, I made a space in my closet to keep all of them in. Now, recently, me and my husband just announced our pregnancy, and we threw a party, so we messaged family to come over and celebrate with us. My sister came, and she looked around a lot, for some reason. So since I was suspicious, I made sure to watch her moves. Soon, she started making her way upstairs, and I told my husband to tell people that I was using the bathroom, and I signaled him, showing him my sister going upstairs. So I went to go see what she was doing, and I tried to lay low about it. I saw her look around a few rooms, then she went into my room, and she found my handbag collection and looked around a bit, and took three and stuffed them in her duffel bag. I forgot to mention, but I should have been suspicious by how awkwardly big it was, but I assumed it was for her two kids' stuff. She took like three of them, which were really expensive ones, my Birkin, Chanel, and Dior bags. I screamed, what do you think you're doing? And she dropped the bag and starts saying, why are you following me? And I tell her clearly, because you're trying to steal my bags. And she just starts saying how I don't need all these bags and I shouldn't be so selfish. I told her I'd be happy to give her my old bags, but not these because I enjoy collecting them. I'm sorry if I sound snobby. Soon enough, she goes down the stairs crying unnecessarily loud. And so a few people follow her asking what's wrong. And she said basically the whole thing that happened upstairs and they all started scolding her. But my mom and dad are taking her side, and it really hurt me. So now I'm wondering if I'm the jerk. Not the jerk. Might be a good idea to install cameras though, and obviously do not invite your sister over anymore. You caught theft. Good for you for acting on instinct. If she does this again, please escalate this to the police. Doesn't matter if she's your sister. Not the jerk. I broke my son and his girlfriend up, and he doesn't even know it was me. I, female 49, broke my son and his girlfriend up. They had been dating for almost a year and seemed very happy. For backstory, my son, who's 19, moved out pretty soon after his biological father passed. He told me he wanted to expand on life because he was nervous he would waste it away being depressed over the passing of someone so important to him. I understood completely and allowed him space and freedom. But we talked daily and he visited all the time. After a while of living alone, he moved back. It was around this time that he introduced me to Kaylee, fake name. Me and Kaylee got along immediately. She lacked a mother in her life, and I think she was quick to establish that relationship with me. Off the bat, I noticed she was extremely paranoid and had extreme trust issues, but she wasn't toxic or manipulative, just anxious about where my son was going after work. She'd ask me, and I'd answer with, he went to his friend Mike's house, 
They hang out to play PlayStation with each other. We both genuinely believed that my son was at Mike's house and we had no reason to suspect he wasn't. One night after my son came home to pick up his PS4 to hang out with Mike, Kaylee asked me to pick up some tampons and Tylenol for her. She lived close and her periods were always super intense, so I was used to going out late into the night to help her. My son gets out of work at 4 and is usually home or at Kaylee's place by 5.30, 6 at the latest. It was 6 and he hadn't swung by to drop off his PS4, so I shot him a text before I left the house to let him know why I was gone. It was something like, Hey, Kaylee is on her period, so I'm heading out to grab supplies. You okay? He answered me while I was driving, and I checked it when I got to the store. It was something like, Yeah, I'm fine. Mike needed help building a shelf he bought, so I'm staying a little later. I sent back some messages saying okay, be safe, all of that mother stuff. But I was not ready to see Mike working the cash register, smiling at me as soon as I walked in. I hadn't forgotten he worked here, but obviously figured it was his day off. I smiled back, but immediately I felt sick to my stomach. I tried to rationalize it. Maybe he means he's building it for Mike while he works. I couldn't even think straight. I just got the tampons, some snacks, and Tylenol for Kaylee and went to the register. Mike obviously started small talk with me, paraphrasing because my memory is bad, but it went something like this. Hi, Mrs. OP. Hello, Mike. How are you doing? I'm all right, getting some supplies for my son's girlfriend. I remember he laughed. Speaking of your son, I haven't seen him in a few weeks. I need him to return my PS4 controller that he borrowed. Can you tell him that? I felt sick again. I didn't want to put my son on the spotlight, so I didn't mention the stories my son had been feeding me. I just smiled and said, I'll let him know. I paid for my stuff and I left quickly. I drove to Kaylee's house and gave her the supplies, but I didn't know what to say or how to say it. She was smiling and laughing and looked carefree. She asked me where my son was. I couldn't lie to her. I couldn't. So I answered honestly, I don't know. I didn't know where he was or who he was with. I just told her to call him and ask. She thanked me and I left her house. Later that night at around 8 p.m., my son finally came home. I didn't say much to him, just asked him if he had fun. He said yeah and went to his room. I knew I had to tell Kaylee. Soon after, I went into my room and I called her. I informed her of what Mike had said and how late he had gotten home. She told me that he said he was home hours ago, just tired so he wasn't going to visit. I could tell she was crying and I asked her if she wanted me to come over. I went to her house and we talked about everything and she told me she didn't want anything to do with him and wanted to break up with him immediately. I told her she could and if she wanted, we could be honest and say I told her. After I comforted her for a few hours, she asked if she could still contact me, even if she wasn't with my son. I said yes, but honestly, I'm hesitant about it. I love her, but it feels off to me. I would still help her though. Fast forward a few days and my son comes crying to me that Kaylee broke up with him and isn't giving him any reason. I, of course, comfort him too. He said that she needed time to think about it and would tell him why when she knows what to say. But for now, she is supposedly speechless. I was too, so I don't blame her. He cried for hours in his room and in my arms. And regardless of what he did, of what I did, I comforted him. I want to tell him what I know and I feel bad that he doesn't know. But Kaylee didn't tell him anything yet, so I might wait. Honestly, I feel so stuck. This isn't about cheating, even though I think he is. This is about trust and how he's lying to me and his girlfriend. We both know there is a possibility he isn't cheating, but he shouldn't have to lie if he has nothing to hide. I just want to add a few things. I agree I should have spoken to my son about it first, but I was too emotional and I felt betrayed. I won't disclose anything, but my son is probably mentally ill and I've tried to get him therapy his whole life, but we ran into so many issues such as money and him not enjoying his therapist. I'm going to discuss therapy now that I am financially stable and I can support him in that. The next update will be the last. I appreciate everyone who's commented on this. Lastly, I'm not okay with my son cheating. I may have worded it wrong, but that's because I'm biting my tongue when it comes to expressing how mad, sad, and just grossed out I am. I truly don't think he realizes how much this hurts people, and I want him to be into therapy for that too. Since he was little, he's always hurt people's feelings and never understood how it could have hurt them. I will absolutely stay in Kaylee's life. I just hope that it won't cause any drama moving forward, and I hope my son has an explanation for his behavior. I'll make an update sometime within the following days, but so far all I found out is that my son has sometimes ignored Kaylee for days on end with no explanation, and I haven't heard of it because she's a nervous person who avoids conflict. He also wants to invite a girl over for dinner tonight, which he never does ever, 
and I find it suspicious, but I'm hoping it's his friends. As for the lying, I have messaged Mike in hopes that he knows something about my son. Alright, you're a terrible mother for trading in loving your son for loving his girlfriend. You have no idea what your son is doing in that time. You have no idea what he's hiding from you or her. You made your own conclusions and instead of mothering your son, you went and tattletailed on him to his girlfriend behind his back and you're now keeping it a secret from him. No wonder your son is sneaky and manipulative. He learned it from his controlling mother. I know you probably mean well, but this behavior is disgusting and you need to self-reflect. Update. My son told me the truth today after him and his girlfriend spoke. He was indeed seeing another woman and I told him if he was unhappy, he shouldn't cheat. I'm not trading in my son, but this woman was planning on getting off the pill and selling her soul for my son and I wasn't going to allow her to build her relationship off of a lie. My son and I spoke and he told me her trust issues and whatnot were too much for him and I told him I understand. His biological dad cheated on me and I don't bring it up to him since he passed, but I will not allow a woman to get pregnant and live a life built on lies. He told me he was still in love with her and he only cheated on her because it was that time of the month and he only cheats on her once a month. Kaylee decided to give me a call. She talked things out with her sister and decided to ask him. Apparently, he was cheating but gave her the same excuse he gave me. He said that he's only done it three other times. She called me and told me before my son told me but in his defense, he was busy explaining things to his girlfriend and now Mike, who he accidentally wrapped into this. It's only 12 in the afternoon and he wants to tell me in detail after work, which I told him was okay. He told me he was sorry for lying and I told him it was okay, but it did hurt my feelings. I didn't mention this in the post or to him. His biological father cheated on me before I was pregnant with my son and for the first year of our marriage. I did not want my son to think that was okay. I talked to Kaylee and she's just head over heels for my son and said if he promises not to do it again, she would stay with him. I haven't told him that because it's not my business. They can talk about it. My son has sent a few messages since, but he seems extremely sorry. I am a bit disappointed in him, but I think it's because of what I went through and how hard being a single mother was after the man you thought you loved just left. Kaylee said that she would try to be a more attentive girlfriend, which honestly sucks to hear because this isn't her fault. I'm not going to dictate their relationship and tell her to find someone else, but it does shock me that she can forgive him. As much as I want to be mad at my son, I really can't. I've never gotten mad at him before and I think this situation just brought me back to everything that happened when he was little. I hope my son can learn from this. Tonight when we talk, I'm going to be a little stricter on him obviously, but again, he's an adult. If he decides he's going to cheat on her, I can't stop him. I really do hope that he learns. So who was the girl he wanted to bring around? An old friend from high school. He told me they talked a lot and really connected and wanted to be friends with benefits. Apparently, he wanted to explore his options, but he says that he's in love with Kaylee, so I'm not sure what he's going to do. Am I the jerk for telling a friend I don't want her to join my date and I for dinner? I, 26 female, have a friend, 25 female, who I met in college, and although losing touch for a bit after college, I moved to the same town as her six months ago for work, and we've hung out quite a bit since then. I have kind of integrated into her friend group, five other girls, not including us, although I'm not as close with them as they are with each other, which makes sense, seeing how they've known each other for so long. I was recently on a first date with a woman I've liked for a bit. She's 27 also. We were having coffee at a cafe, and all of a sudden, my friend walks up to us and says hi. Not a big deal. I know she comes here a lot, and I introduce them. My friend is super nice to my date. At this point, I hadn't told my friend that this was a date. She knows I've dated women in the past, but I wasn't expecting her to realize this was a date because it could very well have just been a friend. Then she asks if she can join us and starts to pull up a chair. My date is visibly thrown off by this, as am I, and so I say, oh, I'm sorry, but date's name and I are on a date right now. I'll see you later though. My friend says, oh, I don't mind, and sits down. I reiterate more clearly, I'd love to hang out another time, but right now I'd like for it to just be my date and I. She says okay and leaves. I thought that was the end of it, not at all a big deal. I don't expect her to automatically know who I am on a date with or not. I get a call from a different girl in the friend group that night who tells me that my friend called her and she was upset about what happened earlier. So I immediately call my friend and ask if we can talk. She says it was rude of me to brush her off. It wouldn't have been a big deal to join us and her other friend lets her do this all the time. This gets to me a little bit because I feel like the two situations are only being compared because her friend and I are both not straight. 
I tell her that because it was a date, it's different and that she can't expect to join me on a first date. She keeps arguing and finally I get fed up and I snap at her. Be honest, if I was on a date with a guy, you would have taken no for an answer and not had a problem, and then hung up. She has not talked to me since then, but she told me the entire friend group are now split. I know this because the friend who first told me that she was upset, as well as one other girl messaged me individually to let me know what was going on and that they're sorry about what happened. The messages from the people on her side are making me second guess myself. I do get that I snapped at her on the phone and I was rude at the end of our conversation. I don't think I'm wrong for not wanting her to join us, but am I the jerk for the way I behaved at the end of the conversation? Update. Okay, so the two girls who reached out and sided with me just let me know she's been saying stuff that heavily implies that I'm actually straight. So I guess that explains a lot of it. They obviously were not okay with it. They both left the group chat and still want to be friends with me. The other people in our group chat have said nothing to me, and honestly, I don't need the drama. It sucks to realize a friend of mine felt this way about me for years, but I'm glad I at least know what's up now. I think it's weird that she's making such a big deal about not being able to third wheel on a first date. So weird. Not the jerk. Not the jerk. You were on a date and politely told her that she couldn't join you. No reasonable adult would expect to intrude on a first date and get offended when they were asked to leave. If she had a problem, it was entirely in her own head. Am I the jerk for telling the mother of my kid that I don't want her partner at my son's Taekwondo belt promotion? I, 26 male, have a 5-year-old son with my ex who's 26 female. We share custody of him through verbal agreement. We split time pretty equally between both parties and things have been pretty smooth for the most part. She got a new boyfriend almost two years ago now and it was a weird transition but I believe for the most part I've been pretty welcoming and cooperative with the whole thing since he is involved in my son's life as well. They have another younger baby now as well. For the most part, we're all on the same page when it comes to my son and he's a cool dude that I don't have a problem with. A couple months back now, my ex and I put my son in sports and he's been doing Taekwondo. On her days, she or her boyfriend takes my son to practice and on my days, I take him. Things were smooth. There were boundaries and we didn't really interfere in each other's days with my son since he loves to spend time with us both. Things started getting a little rocky, however, a couple weeks back when her boyfriend decided to join the same Taekwondo my son did. Again, me trying to cooperate said, no problem. You guys do what you think is best on your days. I trust you. I won't lie. It felt a little intrusive for some reason, but I feel like it's something I just have to deal with as a single dad. Things again took a nosedive when on the day I was supposed to take my son to practice, my ex's boyfriend took him instead since he was going there now too. I got upset and said since it was my day, I felt like they stole that from me. I talked to her boyfriend and I told him that as cool as he was, I didn't really want to go see him practicing with my son doing Taekwondo class that I pay for, but that on my ex's day with my son, he was more than welcome to take him to practice if she wanted him to. Fast forward to today. My ex messages me and tells me that my son is getting a promotion to yellow belt this Friday and that her boyfriend is also happening to test for his belt on the same day and at the same time. Keep in mind, this is falling on my weekend. I told her that I feel like I need a little space to experience father and son things with my son without any interference and that I felt a little suffocated. She said it's a public space and her boyfriend can be there too as well. I told her I felt my boundaries as a parent were not being respected and I told her I didn't want him there. We went back and forth and got into an argument about it. I don't know if I'm being too possessive with the time I'm supposed to spend with my son or if I'm not being inclusive enough with his now other side of the family, his stepdad now technically. We're friends, but I don't want to be friends with him. Certainly don't want to share my time with my son with him since he can see him on the days my son is with his mom. Am I the jerk? You're the jerk. Stop competing with your ex's boyfriend. He apparently is now in your son's life and you had better find a way to co-parent nicely. Your son will greatly benefit from a cooperative relationship. If you don't, your son will figure it out and your relationship with him will go south. And the more people that love your son, the better for him. Your son isn't choosing between you and your ex's boyfriend. There's room for both of you in his life. You're the jerk. This event isn't about you. It's about celebrating your son and everyone else who is paying for the class. I think it's weird that the school is mixing ages like that within a single class, but that's sort of beside the point here. Who are you to tell another student they have to miss their promotion just because you are too insecure to see your ex's new partner getting along with your son? If anything, 
you should be grateful that she's found someone who cares about and supports him, instead of all the crappy stories we see on here with partners who treat them like garbage. I'm going against the grain here. I think, so far, no jerks here. I completely get what you're feeling, and I think you're focused on the wrong thing. Your ex is right. You can't demand that her boyfriend miss his grading process because you don't want to see him while your son grades. Besides it being a public place, who does and does not grade up is up to the instructor. Here's what you should do. You apologize for asking for that. Say you realize that it was selfish and also not what you really want. Then tell her, when boyfriend took son to class, it felt like him taking away your limited time with your son and that your real concern isn't whether boyfriend is there, but the symptom that because he's there anyway, it's fine for him to step in on your time with your kid, which it's not. Boyfriend won't take time off to help me after a hysterectomy. My boyfriend and I have been together for almost three years now. We're both single parents and have chosen to not live together at this time. However, we do have lots of sleepovers on weekends alternating between which house. I was recently diagnosed with a blood disorder and subsequently needed to get a hysterectomy. My boyfriend has a great job with PTO, yet he says he can't drive me to surgery or pick me up or help me out afterward because he has to work. Late last year, he suffered some family issues and without even asking, I took time off to be there and be supportive. I'm upset that he won't do the same for me. I get the difficulty of being single parents and juggling work-life-home balance, but I feel like he's being inconsiderate and unsupportive by basically telling me I'm on my own for my surgery and he can't show up in any way to be supportive. Am I the jerk? Am I being overly sensitive? Edit. He works for the federal government. We each have a kid in grade school and he also has a 17-year-old. We live five miles from each other. My surgery arrival time is 5.30 a.m. so he can totally drive me, leave his kids at home, then go back and take kids to school and be back to the hospital in time before my surgery begins. We talked extensively before the surgery was scheduled about the help I'll need and he said he will take care of me because that's his job as my boyfriend. His ex-wife had a similar surgery so he's fully aware of how major this surgery is. My surgery needs to happen ASAP so I don't have much choice in picking a date. Once the doctor told me what day they scheduled it, boyfriend said his day off wasn't until a few days later. He then said there's not much he can do and he said sorry. I finally told him I was upset about his response to helping me during my surgery, to which he replied about how he has to work and take care of his kids, so he thought I should find someone without responsibilities the day of my surgery to help out. I have no family within driving distance. They're all a plane right away. I have had several friends step up to help, as well as an ex-boyfriend offer to help, yet boyfriend is too busy. This is something that, if you're a halfway decent person, you might consider doing for a friend of a friend just because it's the right thing to do. OP. Exactly. I've done the same. I actually told him he wasn't just being unsupportive boyfriend, but also being an unsupportive friend. Not the jerk, but he is. What kind of relationship do you have where you can support him, but he can't support you? If he's unwilling to help you out after major surgery, what's he going to be like in a real crisis? Good luck. OP. You're right. And this seems to be the dynamic in our relationship. He will be supportive only when it's convenient for him. Is there any possibility that there's a good reason? Like, does he have medical PTSD? Or has his mom passed after a hysterectomy? Or is he just terrified of blood? OP. Nope, no reason like this at all. There are many great qualities to him. However, he is only an equal partner when it's convenient. And that con was rapidly becoming a deal breaker. His response to my hysterectomy is the nail in the coffin for me. Update. I expressed how I feel to my boyfriend. He gave me a laundry list as to why it's so hard for him to help me out. He has a job and he's a single dad and he said that people only help when they don't have anything on their plates. But he sees his mistake and will now help me. He's now giving me the silent treatment because I upset him by calling him out. For me, the relationship is now over. Relationship is officially over. He actually broke up with me before I could break up with him. He was so angry about me calling him out and expressing how hurt I was that he ended it. I agree with you all, I deserve so much better. I'm a little mad at myself for putting up with less than I deserve for nearly three years. That's directly related to my wounding, and I will take this time to be single and work on myself, so I can be the best self in the next relationship. This isn't the first time he's acted like an unsupportive jerk, but it sure as heck was the straw that broke the camel's back for me. Thanks for the feedback, and thanks for being more supportive than my ex-boyfriend. Teacher lost it. So, my best friend loves every time I tell this story, so I thought I would share it with all of you. 
In high school, I had an AP English teacher who was very opinionated in her grading. If she loved a book the class had to read and you didn't, you didn't get a good grade on your report when you turned it in. I was an avid reader. In fact, I cleaned out my school library in third grade. Let's just say I wasn't a fan of her literal selections. She was also the kind of teacher that thought her class was the most important one you had. Due to this, the workload was quite substantial. Coming up on our final exam, she gave the class a talk one week before the final. She would be weighing our grade for the semester, giving 60% of it to the final. She explained she was preparing us for college. However, since she was giving so much weight to the final, she would give us an opportunity to earn extra credit. For every four lines of the epic poem, The Rime of the Ancient Mariner, you could memorize and write verbatim on the back of the test, you would receive one point of extra credit. Goody goody hands time. I had a rough year due to her grading style, so I was getting a B in the class at the time. However, this was my moment to shine. I have a knack for remembering things. In fact, as a freshman, I learned all of the lines for the lead role of Neil Simmons, Rumors, two hours before opening night due to the lead dropping out. I then performed the role for three nights without dropping a line. So this opportunity seemed well made for me and I wasn't going to let it pass by. I got home and looked up the poem. It was well over 400 lines. I got to work. The final exam finally came. I sat down confidently in my seat and eagerly waited to receive my test. We received our 15-page final and were told that we had three and a half hours to complete it. I put my name at the top and immediately flipped it over to the back. For the next eight minutes, I ravenously wrote out 400 straight lines from the epic poem verbatim. That step complete, I decided to look at the questions she intended for us to answer. It was filled with multiple choice, essays, and fill-in-the-blank questions. I took a few minutes to fill in the blanks I knew, guessed at the multiple choice ones I didn't know, and completely ignored her biased essays. Now for the fun part. After a grueling 15 minutes total into the three and a half hour final, I walked triumphantly up to the teacher's desk. I set my test on her desk and said, have a great summer. She said, very funny. It's a three and a half hour final. Sit down and finish your test. I responded, no, I'm finished. I got over 100. She said, let me see your paper. She looked through my test. She saw the empty essays and empty fill in the blanks. Now even more annoyed with me, she said, you haven't answered half of these. It's a three and a half hour final. Sit down and finish your test. I wouldn't be denied. No, I'm finished. I got over a hundred. At this point, she's getting very upset and the color in her face is starting to shift. How do you know you got over a hundred when you haven't done half of it? She demanded. With a big smile, I said, look at the back. You said for every four lines of the rhyme of the ancient mariner we memorized and wrote on the back, we would get one point of extra credit. You will notice I've written 400 lines from the poem. By my math, that equals 100% of extra credit. Anything I answered in this nonsense is gravy, so over 100. She turned red, her knuckles went white holding the paper, and she stared at me with hate in her eyes. I said, have a great summer, as I walked out, feeling like I had just dropped Mike Tyson with a single blow. I got an A in the class. My final was 145 out of 100. Am I the jerk for canceling our trip after my fiancé decided to bring her son? I, 33, male, have been with Natalie, who's 32, for two years. We're getting married soon, and she shares custody of her 10-year-old son with her ex-husband. Ever since her ex-husband got sick, Natalie kept bringing her son over more often. Sometimes her mom would take him due to work, etc. We've been having issues because of that, because Natalie has to bring my stepson with us wherever we go. We started going out less and less. Since it's been a month since we've gone out, and since her ex has gotten better, I've arranged for a trip to the beach for the weekend. It's supposed to be a couple's getaway. She was excited for it and prepared for everything. The night before the trip, she comes up to me and says, Hey, Tom is sick again, and he asked if I can take Taylor to spend the weekend with us. I was gobsmacked. I asked what she told him, and she said that she agreed. She then proceeded to tell me that she'd like to take Taylor with us to the beach. I got upset and told her to not bother because the trip was officially canceled. She looked at me shocked, but I told her she shouldn't act shocked and surprised after she successfully ruined yet another opportunity for us to have quality alone time together. She went on about how she couldn't believe that I would expect her to ditch her son since her mom was busy as well and getting a babysitter wasn't on the table. I just shrugged and told her it was done. Then I walked out. I went with the guys instead, 
and she's been upset with me about it, saying I could have just agreed to let my stepson Taylor come with us, and we would have at least had some family time together while Tom gets better. She said I was the one who messed up. Am I the jerk? Edit info, because I feel like this has gone into a whole different direction. Folks here need to chill out. Nowhere in my post did I mention not being ready or accepting to be a step-parent. Trust me, I am ready, and so far have been nothing but understanding and patient. I love my stepson and consider him as my own, but, and read this part carefully, my problem is with his mom constantly changing plans last minute and not even asking if that's okay with me. And yes, I had to go out with the guys instead. Didn't know what else to do since she obviously wanted some space from me for the weekend, which is alright with me by the way. I'm not mad about that at all. I'd just appreciate it if she had been a little bit more considerate of my thoughts and opinions. You're the jerk. You marry a woman, you accept her family. She has a son, that's her family. Now it's yours. Get over it or break up. Those are your options. Oh, for goodness sake. She didn't change the plan because she wanted to. Her ex got sick. Just what exactly did you expect her to do in this situation? Drop him off at the orphanage? Leave him home alone? You're the jerk. You said in a comment that you love her son like your own. Did you call your family to see if anyone could watch him? Yeah, OP, I think you're missing the point on multiple fronts. For one thing, dating someone who has a kid means that that kid is going to have to take priority at all times and will need to tag along. That's the nature of the beast when it comes to dating a parent, especially in this case where it sounds like the ex is like long-term sick and has bouts where it acts up. And OP, if it is how it sounds and the ex passes, what do you expect is going to happen? When that kid comes to live with you full time, you're not going to get quality time like you think you will. Getaway trips might rarely happen. Having time alone together will rarely happen. Once again, that's the nature of the beast when you're dating a person with a kid. If you can't handle that now, when it's more like a part-time thing, you are not going to be able to handle it all down the line. Get out of this relationship. You're obviously not really prepared for the challenges being a step-parent actually has. OP, you're the jerk for not breaking it off. We haven't been out for a month, is normal in parent land. It's completely fine to not want to be a parent at all or even just not right now. Unfortunately, that means not dating a woman that has a kid, even if she is otherwise the perfect woman. The fact she hoped you could bond as a family tells me she's really hoping you'll grow closer and see him as your stepson, which he will be. Whereas your reaction that you need a break from him after spending more time with him than usual because his actual dad is sick, let alone that your response to all of this is weakened with the boys, rather than talking through your thoughts and feelings like adults. This isn't going to last. The two of you aren't compatible. Karen demands I babysit for her, even though I won't be able to, because we're friends. So about a week ago, I got a call from someone I would consider a friend. We're not super close, but we are friendly, and we get together with the same group of friends a lot. She called and said that her kids were talking about how much fun they have with mine and wanted to know if we would be free this coming Saturday, a week and a half away at the time. My kids really do like hers, and I want to be better friends with her as well, so I said sure. She was relieved and said her husband would be out of town and she needed a babysitter from 8am to 10pm. I felt like it was a major bait and switch because I thought she wanted to do something altogether, but I felt bad backing out when I had already told her I was completely free that day. I should have said something right then, but I didn't. Well, yesterday, I ran into a friend of mine and she asked if I was excited for Saturday. I thought that was weird because no, I'm not excited to babysit someone else's kids for 14 hours. But I said my kids were definitely excited. She said, oh, good. Is your husband taking them to do something fun or who's watching them? To which I made a face and responded that I was watching them. So then she was the one who was confused and said, so you're not coming? Well, last week I didn't go to the end of year PTA meeting because I had just started my period and I felt crummy and I didn't want to go. I guess after the fact, some friends went out to lunch. They decided to plan a big girls day to relax before the kids are back home all day for the summer. Going to the city, shopping, pedicures, eating at nice restaurants, etc. And when it was brought up that I would probably love to go too, this friend said she needed to talk to me about some PTA stuff that I missed so she would tell me about it when she called me. But instead, she decided to use me as her babysitter. So I called the friend and I told her I wasn't aware of the girls' day at the time and that I wouldn't be able to watch her kids after all. 
She asked if my husband could watch her kids too, which was no. She started crying that she really needed this, and what would she do now since her husband won't be home and it's too late to find someone willing to watch five kids for 14 hours with no pay. And then once the tears weren't working, she just got angry. She said it was rude to back out of a commitment just so I could selfishly do something fun and how I'm an awful friend. My friends are all feeling super uncomfortable with this whole thing. We're all typically a very happy and drama-free friend group, so I know no one wants to take sides, and now I'm wondering if I should even go at all. So, am I the jerk for backing out of watching her kids after I had committed to it already? Obviously, your friend group isn't as drama-free as you think they are. OP. It's true, though. We're not super tight-knit, we don't get together that often, and I know there's times some get together and others don't, and it's not a big deal but I'm beginning to wonder if maybe it is a little more tight-knit than I realized and I'm just not a part of it in that way. You should really question those friends who are siding with her. OP, this has been the most hurtful part of it all. So we're not the type of friend group that gets together all the time and live at each other's houses or anything. We get together for birthdays every once in a while or after a meeting like this day. But I've known most of them since I've lived here for over a decade, so I thought we had some substance to our relationships. But no one is acting like it was super absurd. I'm honestly wondering if I even want to go at this point. Before writing the post, I was just angry and annoyed at this one person. But after reading comments and thinking about it, it's just kind of sad that no one really cared. By the way, I'm definitely not saying I'll stay and watch her kids, but maybe just spend the day doing something for myself. Update. I followed the advice from a lot of you to talk to one of the friends I'm closer to in the group, Sarah, to kind of get a feel for what was going on. Sarah said she was kind of frustrated with everyone. After I ran into the friend, her name is Casey to make it less confusing, Casey had filled everyone in on what had happened. They all agreed that the mean friend, Jenny, shouldn't have lied or tricked me into watching her kids, but they all sympathized with her. I guess it is Jenny's 15th anniversary this weekend, but her husband forgot and had planned a boys camping trip. So she was sad and angry with her husband and they all knew she would really need a little getaway to cheer her up. Though it doesn't sound like anyone blamed me for not babysitting, they were disappointed for her and put all of their energy into making a plan for her to still be able to go. No one really seemed to bat an eye whether I was going to go or not, or cared that I was sad, except for Sarah. However, when it came time to make final plans for everything, someone decided to do the math and realized that if I was going to come, we would no longer all fit into the suburban my friend Kim was going to drive. It's a two-hour drive to the city, so taking one vehicle was definitely ideal. Sarah volunteered to drive her car, and we would just take two but it all just felt so forced and uncomfortable that I just ended up backing out. I mentioned in a few of my comments that I've always known I'm not one of the most involved friends in the group, but I've known most of them for almost a decade, so I guess I thought there would be more substance to our friendship than they all did. I don't think any of them have anything against me or dislike me, but I'm realizing I'm just not that important to them. It was pretty disappointing, and it definitely opened my eyes. So all of that happened on Thursday, and I'm not gonna lie, I was pretty heartbroken by all of it. The next day when my husband came home for lunch, he told me to hurry and pack an overnight bag because he had booked a hotel room for me and my sister-in-law to go have our own girls' night. His mom and sister pulled up an hour later so his mom could watch the kids after my husband went back to work, and his sister, who is seriously just the best, and I had the best 24-hour getaway ever. Am I the jerk for purchasing my guy friend his dream birthday present and outshining his girlfriend in the process? My guy friend, Tom, has been one of my best friends since college. We're in our mid-twenties now, and both of us are currently in committed relationships with long-term partners. I've never had any feelings for Tom, nor has he ever had feelings for me. Since college, Tom has been a huge watch fanatic. Two months ago, he was showing me this stunning vintage watch and made an offhanded comment about how he would die of joy if he were to somehow get his hands on one. Very coincidentally, I was in New York City a few weeks ago and I stumbled upon this watch store that just so happened to have the exact one Tom wanted. It was expensive, I won't lie, at about $2,500, but I decided to get it for his 25th birthday. To me, it was basically fate. My boyfriend and I do very well financially, so this was something that I could personally afford and wanted to buy for Tom, especially knowing how happy it would make him. Tom has a tradition of hosting a dinner party at his place for his birthday and then following up with a cake and gift opening. I told him before the dinner that my gift was a huge surprise and asked if he could save it for last and he agreed. His girlfriend ends up going first and she gets him this gorgeous sweater that she crocheted for him and a book that he's been wanting, 
which I thought was super thoughtful and lovely. Last, it was my gift. When he opened it and saw what it was, he literally screamed, hopped over a bunch of people, and squeezed me in this bear hug. I was so happy to see him happy. It genuinely filled me with so much joy. He even got emotional and I saw him swipe a few tears. He also said that it was the best gift he had ever received. The whole time, his girlfriend was only slightly smiling and stayed quiet. The next morning, I get a text from his girlfriend that essentially said that although she appreciated my thoughtful gift, she thought it was a bit out of touch and lacking awareness. She admitted that Tom had also told her about the watch and she wanted to get it for him, but it was way out of her budget. She accused me of knowing this. I had no idea and still getting it to rub it in her face and to outshine her. She finished by saying how she felt like I had overstepped a boundary by getting the gift and would appreciate me not doing anything similar to it again in the future. I responded and told her that while I could see her point of view, I was just trying to do a nice thing for a close friend of mine. I asked her, wouldn't you rather he had gotten the gift and seen the happiness that it brought him than not getting it at all? She responded that that happiness was only shared between me and Tom and no one else and that she felt hurt by my actions. Only my boyfriend knows about this and he's on my side, but thinking through it all again, I do see how I could have overstepped. But my boyfriend says that it's not my job to apologize for her insecurities. So, am I the jerk here? Not the jerk. You weren't thinking of how to hurt her. You just wanted a nice gift for your friend. Your boyfriend is right. You don't need to apologize for her insecurities. Exactly. I can empathize with how the girlfriend must have felt, but she was out of line to reach out to OP for what was just a kind gesture. It's also what's in the best interest of her boyfriend. She should just be happy for him that he was able to get something he really wanted rather than envious she couldn't provide it. That's real love. I'd say no jerks here. Both point of views are valid. She was right to make the gift and the girlfriend had valid reasons to be upset. Not being in the position financially to make a similar gift, feeling outshined. OP, next time you find something special and expensive, Team up with the girlfriend and make it a shared gift. That's the way to become a bridesmaid instead of being barred from the wedding. The girlfriend's point of view was valid up until she said that that happiness was only shared between her and Tom and no one else. Up until then, I felt bad for her as I could easily empathize with her. I've been outshined in gift giving before. She needs to accept that just because you're someone's significant other, that doesn't mean you will be the only one to provide your partner with happiness in their life. Giving him something that you knew he really wanted was certainly thoughtful, but telling him to save it for last was attention-seeking. I would feel the same way even if he didn't have a girlfriend, but especially because he does. I think you were well-intentioned, but should not have made your gift the star of the show in such an obvious way. He would have loved it just as much if you hadn't showcased it like that and blatantly diminished the gifts everyone else, including his girlfriend, had bought. You're the jerk. It isn't so much her insecurities as your breach of etiquette giving a gift you knew would significantly outshine all the others. This would be like if a male friend bought me a DeLorean for my birthday. I know Reddit boy would feel horrible that he couldn't buy me one himself. Well, actually, I'd, I'd just want to go for a ride in it, to be honest. I mean, it'd be really cool to me. Why can't you love me? <laughs> you want me to speed run the game so you have someone to talk to? Fine. I, 25, female, have a friend who's also 25, who's been wanting me to play Zelda Breath of the Wild for years now. It's not that I'm not interested in playing. Heck, I bought the game ages ago. I've just been more invested in other things. After five or so years, I finally cracked down to play and I absolutely love it. My friend is equally excited and can't wait for me to get to their favorite parts. No, literally, they can't wait. Almost daily, I'm hounded with DMs asking how I like the game. Did I meet A yet? Have I done B yet? Have I finished C Quest? Why is it taking so long for me to finish C Quest? I prefer taking things on my own time. With a game of this scale, I want to take my sweet time exploring and finding things as I go. I feel like I'm progressing the plot at a decent pace, 50 hours into a game that other people have spent 300 hours on, and I'm doing fun side quests. Also, I have other hobbies, and I've been playing the game along with the other things going on in my life. I've told them as much, and they're not very happy about it. At first, they were supportive, if not a little pushy, for me to play the game. When I talk about certain plot points and gameplay that I enjoyed, they'd brush off my gushing and say things along the lines of, Oh, you haven't seen anything yet. You're not ready. Keep going. As I juggled between the game's two main missions, they pushed me to do one over the other because it's where the good stuff happens. 
Despite me saying multiple times that I wanted to go at my own pace and do both missions together, they hounded me with more messages about how I wasn't playing it right. I talked to them about it probably dozens of times and they explained that they were so pushy because they needed someone else to talk to about the game. No, they wouldn't stop hounding me. I needed to keep going for them, for our friendship. I'd thank them later. Speed run. So I thought to heck with it. They want me to speed run, then I'll speed run. I used guides and read up things to finish the game as quickly as I could. I honestly have no clue what I did or how I finished, but I did. I eventually sent them a screen cap of my finished game file and gave them my honest opinion. I hated it. There was no build up to anything. I didn't know any character well enough to be invested in their struggles and the puzzles ranged from stupidly easy to unnecessarily complicated. That part of the game that they couldn't wait for me to find skipped over the dialogue. It wasn't worth the extra time. After all, I needed to finish the game as soon as possible, right? Needless to say, we're not friends anymore. Now that I've returned to my original save file and I'm playing it how I want, I can say that Breath of the Wild is one of the best games I've played. Since I skipped over so much for the sake of being petty, a lot of things still feel new to me. I have no shortage of other friends to talk about the game with, and thankfully, these ones encourage me to take my time. They can't wait for me to get to their favorite parts, but not literally. They'll wait however long it takes me. Am I the jerk for not wanting to share a house in my 30s? My partner, male 35, of one year, and I, 34 female, are looking for a flat to rent so we can move in together, or we can stay in the one I'm currently renting, he can move in. Either one's fine with me. I moved out when I was 18, and with the exception of first year of uni, I haven't lived with flatmates unless you count my ex-boyfriend. My current partner, Adam, has lived with his family till he was 25, then with his girlfriend, then flatmates, then girlfriend and back to flatmates. We're currently looking for flats, and we're lucky enough that rent is not a problem and we can pick and choose. Now, Adam dropped a bombshell. He wants to live with a flatmate, his friend and his girlfriend. I said absolutely no without even thinking about it. I'm way too used to independence to share a flat with other people. That might have been fine in my 20s, but not at this point in my life. Adam got really upset and asked me to at least think about it. I told him that I'm sorry, but I don't have to, and the answer is no. I'm not willing to sacrifice my lifestyle and comfort to share a house with other people. He said his friends can't afford to rent on their own, and we would be doing them a favor. I stood my ground and said, I'm sorry, but this is non-negotiable. He called me a spoiled brat and a selfish jerk. He knows I grew up poor, so the spoiled brat comment was really mean. He's refused to go to the house viewings that we've had scheduled and to the most recent one he brought his friend. I got really annoyed and confronted him once we were alone. He still thinks I'm the jerk for not even trying to share a house and I told him I'm way too old to try it since I know I won't like it. He's still mad. I understand that sharing is a necessity for some while others enjoy it. I like my peace and quiet and I worked hard to be able to afford that. But I worry he might be right. Am I the jerk for not wanting to share my house? Not the jerk. You need to press pause on your plans to move in with your boyfriend if he's more concerned about helping his buddy than with you feeling comfortable in your own home. It's a giant red flag that his response to a disagreement with you is to insult you and then completely ignore your side and overrule you by bringing his buddy to the showing. Exactly. The fact he cares more about his friends than your feelings speaks volumes to me. I would be thinking more about the long-term longevity of my relationship just because of that. I would tell him that you need to rethink about moving in with him at all since you have different thoughts on the matter. Not the jerk. I, 38 female, am in a new relationship with 51 male and his texts are starting to concern me. My current boyfriend and I have been together since February and we've had a few arguments but generally things are good. What I can't wrap my head around is some of our text messages that he sends me. They come out of nowhere and they feel a little nuts to me. I don't know if I'm the one being a jerk here but I don't know what to make of them. I've told him it puts me off, but he doesn't seem to hear me. This is an example of one he sent today after he video called at lunch. I answered, but he hung up and wouldn't answer when I called him back. I left a message saying I guess he didn't have service and couldn't answer, but just call back if it's important. His reply was, What would be the point in answering after seeing you're dressed up? Hair done. This tells me you've been up for hours, and in that time, I guarantee that your phone has been in your hand a lot. And never once did you have the desire or want to call or text and say hello, good morning, I love you, or even buzz off for that matter. 
and that makes me feel bad, to be honest. So, I didn't answer. <laughs> Five minutes later, I got this. And because you still have nothing to say, that just tells me I was right. This kind of thing is getting more frequent. I feel like it's kind of excessive, but he says it feels like I don't love him. I don't even know how to respond, honestly. Update. I packed a bag, my laptop, my pew pew, important paperwork, etc. Most of my stuff is in storage because we were supposed to move at the end of the month. I didn't want to leave him there, but his text got really ugly when I told him it was over. I feel a lot safer at my friend's house out of town. The barrage of texts have gone from nasty to desperate to accusing me of lying and never caring about him to him taking photos of gifts he supposedly bought me to making horrible threats. Apparently, I'm not giving a hoot about it, but here I sit trying to talk to you and work this thing out because I care more about you than I do the lies. I love you, D. Why can't that be enough for you? I'm so done with this BS. It's probably going to be hard trying to get him out of my life, but I'm saving the texts and I'm going to at least try to get a protective order tomorrow. Thank you all for your comments. They reaffirm that this behavior is unacceptable. I think I kept adjusting to the new normal every time he would do something that was off, but not quite bad enough to break up over. We had endless talks about his behavior and he was very good at reassuring me he'd work on it and then being the best boyfriend imaginable. It's like he's two different people, but I'm positive the nice side is an absolute lie now after some of the stuff he said. I'm safe for now and definitely won't be going home without an escort. To answer the questions about why we moved in so quickly, we've been good friends for five years and he never once acted like this. I thought I knew him pretty well, so that's why I gave him the benefit of the doubt for so long and let him move in. When he proposed, it was so romantic and he was so convincing, I got a little swept up in the idea that it was real. Karen doesn't like that I removed my rose bushes, so I send her on a goose chase. Karen comes over and knocks on my door and tells me she doesn't like that I removed the rose bushes and I told Karen I don't care. She asked me to clarify what I said and I say, I don't give a hoot what you think. Shocked, she goes, you can't speak to me like that. To which I said, well, I just did. Who do you work for? Quick thinking. Oh, I work for local HVAC company as a sales manager. She goes, oh, that's nice. Two days later. Karen comes over and tells me that I've never worked for a local HVAC company and I'm lying. I smile and go, oops, forgot I just changed jobs. I work at the local digital ad agency. Karen goes off on her merry little way. Three days later, she comes back and advises me it's a crime to lie to her about where I work at. I laugh. She tells me I'm being unprofessional. I laugh. Boys, I work for a 100% work from home company that no one has ever heard of and I haven't updated my LinkedIn since I started my job, not even sure if it would be possible for a regular person to figure out who I work for. I go, fine. Look, you can go complain to my boss if you want, but I'm the GM at the local Ford dealer. It's been four days. No, I don't work at the local Ford dealer. No, Karen hasn't come back. I sure hope the GM at the local Ford dealer doesn't share a similar name to mine. My best friend told me to leave the guy that I was dating but now she's dating him. I do not know what to do and I need to rant. A little backstory. I've dated this guy on and off for multiple years, but this time it was actually getting serious. However, things started to get weird again. He started ignoring me, would walk past me when he saw me, became distant and avoiding, but sometimes he would be very cute towards me, called me late at night just to make sure that I got home safe, mostly when I went out on the weekends, give me unexpected shows of love, etc. It was all very confusing. So one day I was ranting to my best friend about it and she basically told me to leave him. Mind you, the three of us have been close friends for a very long time. But she started saying that he didn't deserve me, that he was immature, that it was always the same with him, that I needed someone who would appreciate me for me. And I agreed, but I still wanted to give him a chance, so I did. Almost every day she kept asking me about it and reminding me, when she could, that he was mistreating me. Which he was, no one deserves to be ignored for no reason. Finally, things ended between us after I poured my heart out to him and he promised that he would change for me. But the next day, it got even worse and he couldn't even look at me. After that, I really didn't talk to him and tried to avoid him, just as he had done to me. I was too hurt to even face him. A few weeks later, we saw each other at a party and he apologized and told me that he had really bad commitment issues. And that was that. I cut all kinds of contact with him after that. 
In that same party, however, he spent the whole time with my best friend, outside and alone, doing who knows what. I didn't really go up to them because I wanted to avoid the whole situation and believe that she was just hanging out with a long-term friend. It's now been around four months and my best friend and him have started dating. How did I find out? By another mutual friend of ours when they asked me how I felt about it. Needless to say, I had no idea. Now my friend is poking around asking why it feels like I'm mad at her. I haven't spoken to her about it and it's really not in my plans to do so. I have slowly diminished contact between us especially now that I'm on a holiday vacation. What do I do now? Am I overreacting? You are not overreacting. There's no way that she wasn't interested in him when she was telling you to break up with him. There's no way her opinion of him changed so quickly. Even if somehow she fell for him after you two broke up, you would not want to be friends with someone who would date someone who treated you like your ex. She knows how he treated you, yet thinks that he's a good person to date? You're better off without her in your life. So just live your best life away from someone who wants drama. Your best friend wanted you out of the way so she could get the guy. I'd cut her out of your life personally. Karen insists I share my Nintendo Switch with her brat. This just happened the other day, and after sharing this story with my friends and family, a few of them suggested that I share it here. The scene is a Southwest airline flight. I was sitting in a window seat next to two lovely ladies, and directly horizontal from us was an empty seat, a mom and her son. The flight was taking off. For those who don't know, you are required to stay seated and keep your seatbelts on for the beginning of the flight until the captain says otherwise. I was strapped in my seat and decided to take out my Nintendo Switch from my carry-on beneath my feet. Excuse me, ma'am. I didn't realize at first that the mother in the seats horizontal from me was trying to get my attention. She unbuckled her belt and moved to the empty seat by my aisle closer to me. Ma'am, with the video game. I lifted my head, but the stranger next to me nudged me as well. That lady wants you to get your attention, the woman next to me muttered. I turned my head to see this woman leaning across the aisle with her hands on the armrest of the aisle seat in my row. Sorry, she began. I just wanted to know if there was any way that my son could use that game for a little while. I'm so sorry, I began. My Nintendo Switch is just really important to me. I don't feel comfortable giving it to anyone I don't know. I don't even let my sister play with it. I was going to continue, but the woman cut me off. Oh, my son's not like most kids, she replied. He's not destructive. His cousin has one of these, and he knows how to play it. She smiled and set her hand out. The two women seated next to me looked at me as if they were also in disbelief. I'm sorry, I said again. I just don't feel comfortable with it. I bought it for me. How old are you? The woman said with a huff, retracting her hand and slapping it in her lap. I'm 25. But I don't see how that matters, I replied, growing exceptionally uncomfortable. Well, she began, clearly sounding agitated. My son is eight. This is an hour and 45 minute flight, and he just wants something to do. He can't see it for a few minutes. No, I'm not comfortable with that. I'm sorry, but I'm expecting you to understand since this is my property. I put my head down and I unpaused my game as to ignore anything else that she had to say. Are you serious? She seemed genuinely livid. Well, son, sorry buddy, not everyone knows how to share, the woman said to her kid who was next to her. Her kid started whining and kicking the seat in front of him. Thanks for this, she said to me. A sweet kid just wants to share with you and you're being ignorant about it. Before I even opened my mouth, one of the ladies in my row snapped back at her. How dare you bring that energy on this plane? She told you so kindly that she doesn't feel comfortable with passing her electronics to a stranger. The mother wasn't having it. She's an adult and can't share with a kid for a few minutes of a nearly two hour flight? You should have brought something for him to do then, the woman in my row responded. It shut her up good. At the end of the flight, the woman collected her luggage from the overhead bins and said, I hope you're happy going against God's word, not sharing with a kid. Some of the people around us giggled. I'm sure they all overheard the drama at the beginning of the flight. I've come across some entitled people in my life, but this strange lady took the cake. The perfect comeback at baggage would have been to ask the chapter and verse where this was going against God's word. Am I the jerk for not allowing my daughter to quit competitive dance? I, 30 female, have a daughter, Lily, who's 14. We just moved states, husband is in the army, and she'll be going to a new school soon and she's deciding on her new subjects. She did French last year and did extremely well, was way ahead in her class, 
but she spent a lot of time after school studying for that one language. She said she had fun doing it, doubtful, and enjoyed it very much. I need to add that Lily does competitive dance, which means that she doesn't have much time left after school. I did competitive dance as a kid, and I know how hard it is to find time for studying. She came to me the other day, telling me that her new school doesn't offer French, but they offer Spanish, and she wanted to take it, and asked me if I could sign her up to private French lessons so that she can learn both languages. I told her that absolutely not, that with her dance, she won't have time for that, and it's too difficult of a subject, taking up too much of her time. She told me that she hasn't been enjoying dance for a while and was too scared to tell me, but she wants to quit dance. She told me that she wants to study languages and work with that when she's an adult. I told her that she won't be quitting dance because she's too good at it, and I already put in a lot of money and that she doesn't need to know other languages. She'll get by with English just fine. Of course, as teenagers do, she threw a fit and ran to her room. She accused me of living vicariously through her. When did a 14-year-old learn that phrase, though? And I grounded her for it. She hasn't talked to me since this morning. My husband came back from work and asked me what happened, and I explained to him that she told me that I should consider letting her quit dance, that languages are a useful skill. Apparently, they always look for people who speak languages, and it'll be better than dance for her future. I told him I didn't want to talk to him anymore and called my sister to vent. Surprisingly, my sister took my husband's and Lily's side, and she joked that I should post here if I don't believe her. So I decided to give it a try. Am I the jerk for not allowing my daughter to quit dance and take language classes instead? You're not listening to your kid's interests. She told you what she likes. You don't believe her, her dad, or your own sister. Hopefully, you believe countless people who think you are the jerk and a huge jerk at that. I couldn't believe that. She put tons of extra hours in and did really well in French, but mom still doesn't believe she could have enjoyed it. Just because OP loves dance and hates learning new languages doesn't mean her daughter will be the same. Knowing more languages is certainly a better career path than pro dancing. So two people told you that you're in the wrong here and you're seeking people to agree with you. Stop living your personal dreams through your daughter. What is your end goal for her? Something you couldn't achieve? She already told you she doesn't want to continue dance. Time and money, your unfulfilled dreams, all on your daughter's back. Do you know what normal parents do when their kid decides they don't enjoy a sport anymore? They allow them to quit and focus on something they love. Your daughter is going to resent you forever. You're the jerk. Not the jerk. Going against the grain here, but I don't think you're the jerk for this. I used to play golf professionally, even won a few big tournaments. Golf was my life, even how I met my wife. She was working an event I competed in during college. Naturally, I wanted my son to follow in my footsteps. When your dad is a professional golfer, you have a world of opportunity that most kids never would. When he was growing up, I spent a fortune on his lessons, top of the line equipment, training camps, you name it. My boy ended up getting a full ride scholarship thanks to his golf talent and I couldn't have been more proud of him. We threw a huge celebration for him and there were even some big names in golf that came to the house. A few weeks before he was supposed to leave for college, he broke down one night and told me this wasn't what he really wanted. His dream was to go into the army, which some recruiters at his school had tricked him into thinking was a good idea. I can't even begin to describe how disappointed in him I was. We had a huge fight about it. I told him if he makes this stupid decision to never speak to me again. He didn't and he shipped out later that month. He gave up his scholarship and all the opportunity that would have come with it, so I never spoke to him again after that. As far as I was concerned, I had no son. In 2011, he went missing in Afghanistan. My wife is in denial and thinks we'll hear from him someday. But I know he's gone. I can feel it, an emptiness I can't even describe. Why couldn't my boy have just played golf? I caught my girlfriend using dating sites behind my back. We've been together for about a year and a half now. Last week, I went out to her place in the morning to surprise her with some food. We've been fighting a bit, so it was going to be a full date day. She rolled over in bed and I saw a message on her home screen saying, You're such a beautiful girl. Why are you on dating sites? So at this point, she had just woken up. Obviously, I'm pretty tense and she asks me if I'm okay. I'm like, I'm not really sure. I just saw a message on your phone that said, why are you on dating sites? You're such a beautiful girl. She replies, what are you talking about? That's crazy. I'm not on any dating sites. And then she ran to the restroom. She was in the restroom for quite a while and then finally comes out and goes, yes, I was on dating sites. We've been fighting a lot, but it's not like that. I just wanted to see what was out there. I left because I was in a pretty big panic. 
My ex prior to her that I was with for 10 years cheated on me constantly and it destroyed me, so she knows how I feel about this kind of stuff. She texts me and says, I didn't even cheat though. I would have never even met up with anyone or talked to anyone without telling you first and breaking up with you. I'm sorry that I downloaded it. I was just lost and hurting. We don't have an open relationship of any kind and obviously she was talking to someone since that was over text, meaning she's been giving out her number. She keeps saying things like, I'm sure it's all very worse in your head. I questioned her a bit more on it and she said, He was the only one I messaged. I matched with people and let my inbox fill up. I only responded to him because he's friends with Danny and Aaron. She keeps telling me it's worse in my head and I'm overreacting. I'm so torn apart. I love this girl, but after my ex, I promised myself I'd never put myself through that again. She says she doesn't want to lose me and will do whatever it takes. She said I can look through her entire phone now. Kind of late since she had a week to delete everything. So a few questions. Should I even give her another chance? Is this cheating? If I go through the phone and find obviously deleted messages, how should I respond? Is she trying to gaslight me? She just wants to hold on to you until she finds the next best thing. If you're having problems in a relationship, you should be focused on trying to find ways to make things better. You don't go on dating sites to see what's out there. How does that make your relationship better? She's already emotionally checked out. Let her go. If she keeps on justifying her actions and blaming you for overreacting, then you know it's over. She's trying out her other options while keeping you as the safe option. Based on her comment, without telling you first and breaking it off, once she finds a viable candidate, she'll just move ahead and dump you. Every single fight or argument you guys have from this point forward, you're going to wonder if she's cheating on you. It's not worth it. And like the other commenter said, she's holding on to you while keeping her options open and no healthy relationship can grow from that. My husband, 38 male, doesn't think that I love him. For reference, let's call my husband Jack and my daughter Lily. Jack and I have been married for about 10 years, dated for 5, and have a 4-year-old. Overall, we've had an absolutely wonderful relationship. Sure, occasionally we hit a rocky spot, but we always recovered stronger than ever. Most of our friends look at us as the ideal couple too. I've never doubted that he loves me and I've tried my best to reciprocate it. Even when he wasn't home often during our first 5 years of marriage, he came back home after that since he got a promotion. We have great communication and I already am planning on how to approach this with him, but a second opinion would be nice, just in case someone else already dealt with something similar. Yesterday he was doing some very acrobatic exercise in our backyard. He does this every day, even when he's almost delirious from fever, which was hilarious to see. I joked that he'd leave me to become a monk. He just froze for a second and responded, maybe after Lily grows up. Sure, this could just be playful ribbing, but I had a bad feeling in my gut and I kept poking at him. He almost fell down, which is very odd since he has excellent balance, made me leave so he could focus on his stuff. That especially made me feel even worse. The rest of the conversation happened at dinner. The gist of what he said is something like, the signs are all there. He mentioned that we haven't been as romantic or intimate as of recent. He even said something about less attraction on my end, which isn't true. Then mentioned weeks of silence. I don't remember this happening at all. Frequent absence. I haven't been going out much except with my friends for dinner dates, which isn't often, just four times a week for now. Something about initiation. The only one that somewhat made sense was how I was cutting couple time for friend time or game time, which doesn't happen all that often. I can only count two or three times last week where I did that and we still had an hour or so out of planned three or four hours to spend together, so he shouldn't have had an issue. What he did next honestly broke my heart and I almost started crying right there. I don't think you love me as I do you, but that's fine. We'll raise our kid, grow old, and exist until we die. I already have a few hobbies that can make me happy. I can't make you responsible for all my happiness. That would be unfair. And he said that with the most deadpan expression ever, like we were talking about the weather or how our day went. I tried to make him understand that this hurt me, but it didn't seem to land at all. He just kept staring at me blank-faced, and I honestly felt terrified. Afterwards, we slept in the same bed after he put Lily to sleep and we cuddled like normal, which was so jarring to me. I've put a lot of work into keeping us together, so to hear this from him has hurt me deeply. It's even worse because what he describes sounds exactly like his parents. They're two old, bitter people who stayed together to raise him and still stay together, for God knows why. I've never seen them be loving towards one another and only once towards him. He was always very particular about that stuff, 
and said he never wants to have something like that. A few years ago, he said that he was so glad we weren't like that and that he was so lucky to have someone who actually loves him and won't spontaneously stop because folded clothes wrong. Which made me fall in love all over again to know how much I meant to him. And then there's all that stuff he said, and I honestly can't remember something like not talking to him or silence. But I remember how his mother used to forget things. Like she'd do something wrong, get that wrong thing pointed out, and then forget it ever happened. One time she was saying something about how my kind of people are less likely to succeed in business and she'd become a housewife, which is weird because she's a lawyer and he certainly hasn't said anything like that and is very proud of my passive income stuff. My husband called her out on it, stone-faced, and defended me. I didn't like that he said that I made more than him at the time because I was afraid his mom would say something, but she backed down after that. She forgot about that incident a day later. She couldn't recall that lunch or what we had said or anything. He didn't want to subject me to that, but I insisted since family is pretty important to me, so we went back a few times. This same thing has happened at least two times, the target switching to him. I'm proud of him for standing up to her and she can't remember any of it. Eventually, I got a begrudging approval from her. His dad didn't care too much and was like, whatever makes you happy. From the start, which was nice. I'm crying my eyes out at a friend's house. I wanted to take Lily with me this morning, but she was in the middle of some class with Jack helping her do some activity the teacher gave them, so I just went on my own. I feel so heartbroken right now, and I don't know what could have happened to make him think this way. I've been having a great few years since he's been home the last five or so years and lightened the load on taking care of Lily. What happened? Does anybody have experience dealing with something like this? This is a complete breach of my trust, and I'm hurting so much from what he said. Any advice is helpful. I plan on returning at lunch and dinner for Lily's sake, but I'll try to talk to him after I've settled for a day. Edit, four hours in. I've canceled my plans for the week and told my friends nothing about why. One of my close friends, who is very friendly towards any husband, asks for him every time I go to their houses and spoils and plays with my daughter, then suggested it was my husband and said he was controlling and other things. I told her to stop, but she didn't, and nobody in the group did anything to stop her. Some even joined in. I've cut them all off. I can't believe this. Edit. Working on what to say tonight. Also working on replacing friend time with date nights. Somebody said I have to make him fall in love with me again. That's a goal. Edit. Went back home. Mostly finished the list of things to say. Found him repeatedly smashing his shoulders into a tree and actually denting it. Lily was watching and eating ice cream. She seemed tired but didn't want to go inside yet. I'm making dinner tonight. Update. This went better than expected. I wish I could say that there were tearful embraces and we spent a passionate night rekindling our marriage in record speed like a Lifetime movie, but no. Still, this is what I'd say is one of the best case scenarios. Firstly, I'll clarify from the other post on a few things I've noticed that people are getting blatantly wrong. Most seem to think that I am gone without him several nights a week, around two to three times max. Four was a unique case and I misstated that. Don't initiate hooking up. I'm the only one initiating, and I get turned down half the time, which, as you can imagine, is doing wonderful things to my self-worth. I literally have to spend minutes convincing him to get anything more than three times a week. Cancel plans with him regularly for friends. I want to say no, but I'm beginning to doubt my own judgment. He's also invited to every single friend night. He just prefers not to come along. Affair. I'm not going to parties or clubs or anything like that. That's a hard boundary I set for him as well. The get-togethers and dinners are usually held a few houses down at my former friend's house, a 10-minute walk away. Now on to the update. Dinner was very good. Jack and Lily loved their meals, and afterwards I did what a commenter suggested and asked Lily, Do you love mommy? She answered yes. Do you love daddy? The yes was bigger. You think daddy loves mommy? Another adorable yes. You think mommy loves daddy? Silence. I felt like I had gotten slapped. I'm not sure if it showed on my face, because Jack immediately came between us and rubbed her hair. He gave a very loud, boisterous, of course she does, picked her up and carried her to bed while tickling her. Pretty sure I was still reeling from that revelation, but I snapped out of it. Weirdly enough, he seemed annoyed when he got back, which is strange since he rarely ever shows something like that. Anyway, I remembered my points and pretty much unloaded everything in a half blueberry mess. I said that I was sorry for everything, that I got too caught up with old friends and I was blinded by all the activities and catching up and get-togethers, that I didn't realize how much time I was cutting from our plans and our time and family. 
I was sorry for leaving this morning and trying to make this about me when he's trying his best for our daughter. I've been a bad partner, I know. I told him that I really appreciate that even if he has doubts, he's still willing to be true to me and I'm proud of him for having the courage to communicate because it really needed to be said and how I couldn't imagine how hard that was for him. That I wouldn't be associating with that group again because I realized what they really thought of him and that I was stupid not to have realized it earlier. That I know I hurt him and broke his trust and I'm sorry he had to go through all of this and that I never noticed because I was too caught up in my own life when I should have been caught up in our lives and I'm sorry. That we should be a team and that I don't only want to stay together for Lily but I want him. If he had anything else to say or any doubts, to please say it because I'll genuinely listen this time and I won't get defensive. Q hand-holding over table. That I do really care for him and I was sorry that I haven't shown it recently and to please just give me a chance, just one chance, that's all I need, to give me the opportunity to show him that I love him. He just took a few breaths and said general issues that I pretty much initially dismissed. He also said that it would be a while before he trusts me enough to say anything that might send you running to your friends which hurt considering the fact that I gave them up for him, but I mostly understood where he was coming from now that I wasn't feeling attacked by what he said. It still hurt when he added, you'll change for a week or two, then change right back and forget it ever happened. I told him that was fine and all he had to do was let me show him how much I care. All in all, it was great. All the planning paid off and it felt like a weight was off my chest. I even did the small gestures of comfort stuff during it, like holding hands and meeting eyes. I could almost see a little change in his expression, mainly the eyes. He was blank-faced throughout the whole thing, but I could tell he was fighting to not break down since he rarely trembles. One of his tells is when his fingers start to spread out like some silly claw shape. That certainly didn't happen before. I knew there was hope. I've already booked a babysitter on his free day and have a reservation for a fancy restaurant that he likes. He agreed to go out with me with a small nod and I honestly felt ecstatic. I immediately hugged him and even though he was a bit stiff at first, he returned it. It's been a while since we felt together now that I think about it and the feeling is different and bubbly. He went to sleep in the same bed and got excited when he held my neck and brought us closer and stared in my eyes while touching foreheads, then disappointed me when he just went to sleep. And to all those people who say he should leave me, seethe, it isn't happening. Am I the jerk for expecting my boyfriend to pay rent if he moves in with me? This is a doozy. I've been dating Josh for a year. I should say now that I, 24 female, don't ever want to be legally married and Josh, 30 male, is divorced and doesn't want to remarry. We also live in a place where there is no common law marriage. Still, we want to take things a bit further and we're talking about Josh and his two daughters moving in with me. I own a three bed, two bath house in a nice area. Josh rents a two bed, one bath apartment and his lease is coming up. My mortgage is $1,000 a month and Josh's rent is $1.4,000 a month. It was important to me that we would have everything figured out before making the change so that there would be no surprises or disagreements about who pays what. I figured it would be unreasonable for Josh to expect to just live with me for free, especially since I'd be giving up one of my rooms so his daughters could have a room. I suggested that Josh pay $700 a month to me in rent, half of what he's currently paying. I would cover the cost of any home repairs, internet, garbage, etc. Then we would split utilities, even though there's three of them and one of me. I don't mind splitting since that would be about what I'm currently paying I predict. And since I meal prep once a week, I would just get my own groceries and he could get theirs. When I laid everything out, Josh was very unhappy and said that since it's my house, he shouldn't have to pay rent and that we should split groceries. I told him he was welcome to buy his own house and I would move in with him and happily pay rent while renting out my own house. He was mad at me because he said he's not in a position where he can buy a house. We can't come to an agreement so I suggested he just find another apartment. The owners aren't letting him renew, and we could revisit the topic in a year. He's not happy with that either because rent prices have skyrocketed here, and two bedrooms now go for around $1.8,000 a month, and he thinks he won't be able to find a place he can afford. I'm a bit frustrated because I feel like $700 a month is a really good deal compared to the likely $1,800 he will have to pay. Since we aren't going to get married or anything, I don't understand why he thinks I would be okay with him living for free with his two kids. I'm happy to have romance and companionship, but shared assets and finances are not something I want in life. I don't want to support a man. Am I the jerk for expecting my boyfriend to pay rent? Edit. I showed Josh this post and he thinks you are all wrong. So here's some input from him. Leslie makes $120,000 a year and I make $30,000 a year. 
I'm living paycheck to paycheck, supporting two kids with no help from my ex-wife. It's gotten so expensive here that at this rate, I'm not even going to be able to feed my kids soon without going to the food bank. No matter what, they're going to get fed. But it's not fair that she owns a house and can go on vacations or spend $400 a month getting her hair done when I can't even buy my kids name brand cereal. She shouldn't charge me to live with her because she should understand that I want to be able to spend whatever I can giving my kids the childhood that they deserve. Not for me, but for them. Just two hours later. Update. Thanks Reddit. Oh you won, and I'm glad I posted here. After a very loud and angry argument with Josh, I broke up with him. Despite pretty much everyone telling him he was wrong, Josh insisted that I should basically support the three of them because it's what would be best for his kids. He doesn't seem to understand that they aren't my kids and no one is going to want to bankroll the three of them, at least no one with a brain. The point is, I'm young, good looking, I own a house, I can do better than a broke single dad who has no education and a crappy job who thinks it's okay to mooch off me and scream in my face when I tell him no. Hope your next girlfriend is stupid enough to put up with you, Josh. No wonder your ex-wife left you. Am I the jerk for calling my fiancé selfish for wanting to announce her pregnancy at her cousin's wedding? My fiancé, who's 29, and I, 31 male, just found out that we're pregnant. My fiancé mentioned that she wanted to wait to announce it at her cousin's wedding, which will be taking place on Sunday. Her cousin and her husband have been struggling getting pregnant even with IVF. Recently, they got some news that their insurance has stopped funding IVF, so when my fiancé brought it up to me, I told her it's not at all a good idea. This just seems so wrong, especially it being at their wedding. I asked if she was going to at least ask her cousin for permission, and she said no, because she wanted it to be a surprise for everyone. I told her it's not the time nor the place for it, and that it would take the spotlight off the couple. In her family, there hasn't been a baby for three years, so we'd be the first in that time. Fiance feels that's the perfect time because it's such a joy, and it's not like she can keep it away forever, and their problem shouldn't keep her from telling something so positive. So it's on them if they turn it negative. I told her that's not the point. She knows what they've been through, and she's being selfish if she actually goes through with it. She cried and claimed I wasn't being supportive of her, and I shouldn't be calling my pregnant fiance selfish. She doesn't want me to come with her to the wedding anymore, feeling as if I would ruin the mood. She hasn't been talking to me either. Edit. So about my fiancé and her cousin's relationship. My fiancé always saw competition in her cousin because her cousin would be better at some things than her. Grades, dancing, cosmetics, etc. Since they were kids and she hates that. Last year they had an argument about it because fiancé felt her cousin bragged too much. Whereas my fiancé also mentioned there was one thing her cousin wasn't good at but never said what it was. So in shorter terms the relationship is in between good and bad but her cousin wanted to invite her to the wedding. I'm guessing to rekindle that. Update. Sorry for the long wait. I've been going through some things. Me and my fiancé breaking up, work, the passing of my grandfather, etc. So I didn't expect to get a bunch of replies on my post, but a lot of them were helpful. My ex was determined to go to the wedding, despite my protests, and even planned out how she was going to be refusing alcohol when offered. I did tell my ex's parents about what she was planning on doing. I didn't want to tell the groom or the bride because I wouldn't know how to put it in words that wouldn't make the whole situation less awful. Ex's parents did end up telling the bride's parents and they told the bride. The bride was so upset that she, unfortunately, called off the wedding. Everyone wanted her to continue it and invite my ex for a couple of plans guests thought of. Example, when my ex announced it, everyone would just stay nonchalant and not give her the excited reaction she was hoping for and the classic just don't invite her plan. The bride just understandably wanted to be left alone and she texted my fiancé a very long paragraph telling her what a horrible person she was. She just decided not to do the wedding anymore and her fiancé was very heartbroken. But all in all, they were both very grateful to me. My ex instantly knew that I was the cause of all of this and she was furious with me, even more because I posted about it here, but also said a pretty sick thing about how she still pretty much won anyways. I just decided to break up with her myself after that. Some of her family members are kind of upset with me, as they believed I just caused a bunch of drama. Now I'm currently in the works of talking to an attorney, as my ex told me I will not be seeing the baby after they're born. So, on top of all of the grief, working, breakup, being called a mess starter by some of her family, and still feeling like crap, because either way the bride and groom were heartbroken, it's just putting a bunch of anxiety and stress on me. Am I the jerk for giving back everything my family bought for my son? My wife and I welcomed our son into the world early this month. 
Prior to his birth, we had been given a lot of very nice clothes and toys by my parents for him. My mother-in-law also made some pretty incredible clothes and blankets. My wife, her siblings, and their mom lived in poverty for a large part of her life. Their dad abandoned the family and left my wife's mom with a large pile of debt that weighed on them. So their life wasn't easy. My mother-in-law often made her kids clothes versus buying them because it was cheaper for her to do so. She worked in a store that had a lot of fabrics that they were allowed to take the excess of. She's talented and always put an effort into making sure the clothes looked good enough so that the kids wouldn't be bullied. Those clothes are something my wife treasures. She remembers how much love and effort went into them. She also appreciates that her mom tried to make them work enough to blend in at school, that it saved them years of potential bullying. All these years later, and mother-in-law is still dealing with the debt. She does not have a lot, so she made some amazing clothes and blankets for our son. One of the outfits was even his take-home outfit. But then a couple of days after our son was born, she comes over with a bag of clothes she bought, saying she wanted him to have more. My wife and I were shocked. I could see she was upset and looked almost guilty, so when my wife went to nap, I asked her what was going on. At first, she said nothing and she just wanted her grandson to have more, but then she apologized for embarrassing us. I asked her what she meant. She told me my parents had talked to her after the baby shower and told her that she had left all of the grandparents spoiling to them. That she should understand if we never put our son in any of the clothes because really they look like the kind of homemade clothes from 70 years ago when people were left with no choice. They accused her of not caring enough. I told her I was so sorry that they had said that. I assured her I had never said anything like that to them. That my parents had no idea what it was like to have nothing and were being judgmental jerks. I even convinced her to take back the clothes she bought and return them to the store. I then gathered up everything my parents gave us and went to their house. My parents didn't even try to deny it when I confronted them. All they did is look down at the effort she put into them. They said we couldn't seriously be okay with those being the only gifts. I said we were, and as far as I was concerned, they were the only truly generous gift he got, and I told them it was their gifts I was embarrassed of. I gave them the stuff back and told them we were no longer accepting their gifts after what they did. They are furious, saying I reacted way too harshly and saying it's a jerk move to return gifts. I'm furious with them too. Am I the jerk? We talk all the time here about what you really have is a spouse problem. This is textbook how to not be a problem spouse. You stood up to your side of the family in defense of your partner and her side of the family. No one had to argue for you to do it and you didn't angst over how unfair it is to harm your relationship with your parents just because they were jerks. No, you saw the harm done and took accountability for rectifying it and ensuring it won't happen again. Bravo! Congratulations on your bundle of joy and congratulations to your wife on choosing the right person to spend her life with. Your folks are jerks, but you're not the jerk. Your mother-in-law sounds awesome. I would be so honored to get baby clothes made by a grandparent's own hand. I can't believe she was made to feel badly about such a precious and thoughtful gift. Those are heirlooms. One day you'll be gray and showing off those clothes to your adult kids and sharing stories about what a big-hearted lady your mother-in-law was. How much she loved her kids and grandkids and what a strong person she was. Buy a new one or go home. I used to work at Sonic as a car hop. I usually worked four to five to close. One day I was cleaning up all the drinks the day shift left around and I found a can of Monster. I grabbed it and walked around and asked everyone who was working. The manager, Robert, like normal, was talking to his girlfriend on the phone. When I asked if it was his, he looked right at me, shook his head and turned away without saying anything. After I finished asking everybody else, I dumped it out and threw it away. 30 to 45 minutes later, he comes up front and went to throw away his trash and sees it in the trash. He was livid, started screaming, grabbed it out of the trash and started shoving it in people's face, asking if they threw it away. I told him they didn't, I did. He cornered me against the wall and screamed in my face that I was going to leave and go buy him a new one. Two things, the monster was probably half full, if that, and I hate being yelled at and I had asked him if it was his. We got into this huge fight about it, him demanding I replace it, me telling him to buzz off. This went on for two hours. It was slow because it was winter, so he sent everybody else home. He was cooking. Finally, he told me I was either going to go buy a new one or I was going to go home. It was seven at this point. We closed at midnight. I grabbed my stuff and went and clocked out. He said if I didn't go get him a new drink, I was fired. I said, okay, see you never. Not even five minutes after I left, the general manager, Jeremy, called me asking why I left, so I told him what had happened. 
He said the other manager can't fire me, as only the GM can, and asked me to go back and finish the shift. I told him that I couldn't do that with Robert yelling in my face like that, that I'd go back tomorrow. So, Robert was done for for the rest of the night. Nobody else, not even Jeremy, would come in. He had to cook and run orders for five hours by himself, really upset a lot of customers. And when I went in the next day, he asked why I was back since he fired me and it was a joy to tell him that he couldn't do that. He held a grudge for three whole months. My daughter is demanding that I pay her student loans for her. I'm currently being given the cold shoulder by both my youngest daughter and my wife over this, so I thought I'd get an outside opinion. Both of my two daughters graduated from similarly costing universities. I had a school fund set up for both of them, but it didn't cover everything. They both, after graduating, had about $60,000 in student loan debt. They also both were lucky to find jobs in their fields a few months after graduating with similar salaries, about $55,000 a year. However, they took vastly different approaches to their debt. My eldest for the last three years has lived extremely frugally and outside of basic needs and bills, all her extra money goes into paying her debt off. My youngest, on the other hand, asked if she could live at home until she gets her loans paid off, but she still only pays the minimum required to send every month and spends the rest of the money on herself. Now the issue started a few days ago. My eldest called me all excited because her loan debt was down to $500 and she would be able to finally pay it off when she gets her next paycheck. We spoke for a bit more and after the call ended, I decided to surprise her by sending her $1,000 to pay off the rest of her debt and so she could finally have some money to do something for herself for once. When I was talking to my wife and youngest daughter over dinner about how impressed I was that she paid it off so fast, my youngest started yelling about how I've never given her money towards her loans. I explained that while I'm not directly paying them, I'm still helping her by letting her live at home rent free and she could be closer to paying it off if she spent less on things she doesn't need. After screaming and crying to me a bit more, she stormed off and is staying at her boyfriend's currently. My wife thinks that I should promise to give her some money each month to help her pay off her loan faster so we can keep the peace at home, but I don't think I should reward her for nothing. Not the jerk. Technically, by allowing her to live at home with you this whole time, you've probably paid more towards your youngest loans than your eldest anyway when you take into account extra groceries, power, and water. You're the jerk. If you have the funds to help your daughter pay off her debt, but you're simply refusing to do it out of selfishness and greed, then you really need to think about what's important to you in life. I will never understand parents who have the money to pay for their kid's college, but simply refuse to do so. This is the kind of stuff that will make them go no contact with you. Yowza! And people wonder why Reddit Boy and I don't have any kids. My sister complains about her life, so I gave her a piece of my mind. To start this off, I'm going to give you some context as to why she did and why I didn't pity her. I, 28 female, have a sister, Caitlin, who is one year older than me. Growing up, we were dirt poor. Our family nailed almost every single southern hillbilly idea on the head. We both did decently, but neither of us had ever considered college. Caitlin graduated high school first and got a full-time job immediately. She began to help with bills, but at some point began thinking about maybe going to school. I was having the same thoughts a year later when I graduated. Well, what we hadn't known was that when our great-grandma passed, she left my dad all that she had, which came up to a sum of a couple thousand dollars that they decided to save for us. And because Kate began talking about maybe going to school, mom began to save her bill money and add it to the sum of the money. Unfortunately, it still wasn't a lot, so our parents set us down and explained that they had money for only one of us to go to school and that they would have to think about who to give it to. I was prepared to fight for this chance because I realized that was my chance to better myself. I was ready to do whatever it took, but I didn't end up needing to because Kate gave up. I guess Caitlin realized she wouldn't be picked because I had better grades and was more well-liked because mom told me later that day that she had backed down and said to give it to me. So fast forward, I got my BSN and work as a travel nurse. I do very well for myself and live two hours away from my hometown. I went to visit my sister because she's pregnant with my nephew and I missed her and brought some gifts. We had lunch and we were just chatting about what we were up to when she began to complain and whine that she was tired and asked if I didn't mind if she vented. Before I could answer, she started talking about how she was tired all the time from her shifts at work and then having to come home to her kids and her husband. It sounded a lot like she was regretting her life and after about 20 minutes, it was starting to get on my nerves. She would not stop or change topic. Finally, I lost it and told her that I wasn't here to listen to her complain 
and that she really shouldn't complain about the life she chose. I told Caitlin that if she didn't want to have to get married and have a low paying job, and if she wanted to better herself, she should have fought harder to go to college instead of giving up before she even tried. It ended in her crying, which I felt horrible about, and then she went home without saying anything else. I tried apologizing for how I phrased it, but not for anything I actually said because it was true, but she won't accept it. Our parents have been giving me the cold shoulder and I feel lost because they won't listen to my side of what I said. Am I the jerk here? Karen is about to be homeless and wants to live with me and my son. A brief backstory. Three years ago during lockdown, my ex-wife Petunia cheated on me. We have one young son together and we've been married for seven years. I tried to work things out but her mom convinced her she cheated because she was unhappy with me. It was a very high conflict divorce and at first I made a few bad decisions. Trust, letting her have access to our joint bank account. I had a ton of false police allegations against me and the authorities were called too. So I started to record everything. I walked with a body cam outside. I was utterly self-monitored to avoid allegations. A week after I put up the cameras, I caught her and her family breaking into my house. Legally speaking, she did not get arrested because we were still married, but it does look bad in court. However, I took my lawyer's advice and the custody my state gives fathers. Fortunately for me, she fell in love with someone in a European country and handed away most of the rights to my son. Most, as in I got full custody, but she retained legal custody, like she could pull him out of school or get his medical records, etc. My lawyer said this protected me if we went back to court because she would probably win that before and I would look bad. One year later, she's getting divorced a second time and moving in with our mutual friend. The divorce happened about a month ago and during this time, she has not attempted to visit my son. Side note here, my lawyer advised me to play it cool. Don't antagonize, don't withhold our son. Also, he told me to buy a house. I'm in a position to now and set down roots to make it harder to take him away from me. Again, our divorce was high conflict and I was terrified she would try to take him away from me. I'm more than willing to allow her to see our son and I want to do the right thing and let my son grow up happy. Honestly, that's all I care about. Her history says she's highly volatile and I'm concerned. Current problem. Here's where I need advice. She wants to move in with us for a few weeks until her YouTube career takes off. I am not insane, so I do not have any confidence in said career. I also question her mental health for reasons listed below. What should I do? Our mutual friends, a couple with three kids, grew tired of Petunia and for a good reason. They assumed she would do the usual thing, get a job and get back up on her feet. They also worked very hard and sometimes struggle to get by. So working 10 hours a day to come home to someone doing absolutely nothing is very discouraging. They gave her a deadline to get out or they would involve legal matters. That deadline is in a few days. So Petunia has decided to call me and ask if she could live with me for a few weeks. Petunia joined some new age religion. There's a lot of details to share here, but I want to leave the tangent manageable. I am religious, so I'm careful to not make fun of other religions. It would not be sincere of me to do so, but it started with a reading that she had, which led to going on to TikTok, and she believes that she is a star seed and an ancient alien who came to spread light to the world. It seems like a mix of paganism, Buddhism, and other spiritual things mashed into one. I'm trying not to rant about reincarnations and talking with aliens here, so I've deleted many paragraphs of the issues I take with. She thinks that she's a chosen being, risen above the masses, and of course, that plays strongly into her ego. Everyone internally wants to feel like they're unique, and believing you are of some royal bloodline feeds into that. Right now, I'm legitimately suspecting mental illness. Our mutual friends tell me that they don't recognize her anymore, and that she's being secretive and not letting them know what's happening. I'm a single dad with 100% custody and zero support from the other parent. My dating life is also not looking up, but I have a promising career and we get by. I'm incredibly fortunate in a lot of ways. I've been getting a ton of therapy for my codependent behaviors and I don't need this. She tells me she'll be homeless if I don't take her in. She's not speaking with her immediate family because she moved to another country. If I let her in though, it will seriously affect my mental health. What should I do? I'm leaning towards calling her bluff and letting her figure it out, though it appears she will never get a job. Would the courts hate that? I'm very uncomfortable in this position. Update. I have officially declined. I feel lighter. Like, wow, it's a ton of responsibility I don't have to worry about. I know a lot of you are like, wow, why would you even consider this? You're insane. Yes, I am a recovering codependent, and I also have a very difficult time setting boundaries and saying no. 
I feel strange even just saying no. But also, I feel much better. Mad with power, even. Anyway, she did not respond, but she did leave me on red. Thanks for the energy, guys. I appreciate you all. You would be an absolute fool to let her live with you. It also wouldn't be good for your son. Do not make that mistake. Also, YouTube careers never take off for the vast majority of humans. Am I the jerk for ruining Steve Irwin for my friend's daughter? I, female 38, got to visit my friend recently and spent the night. One of her daughters, who's 13, spent a couple hours watching old episodes of The Crocodile Hunter on TV. My friend said her daughter's been pretty interested in animals and wildlife and nature, so they got her some of those to watch, since she remembers enjoying those as a kid, and the modern versions of them don't seem as good. I thought this was great, as I actually grew up near Biwa, Australia, where the Australian Zoo is, and we went a lot, even into my young adulthood before moving to the US for work. Got to see Steve a couple of times, and later Bindi when she got older, at a couple talks and small group settings. My friend said, wow, you should totally tell my daughter about that. So a while later, I went into the living room where the daughter was watching the shows, and I told her, I got to see Steve a couple of times before he passed, and later Bendy. And she got excited and started asking me a lot of questions about it. I told her he seemed like a great guy, and as much as I could remember about the animals. Then I told her about a detail about the first talk and small group that I saw him at, where he warned us that he had had to help cover for a zookeeper who called in sick, and cleaned out the primate houses right before this talk and he hadn't taken a shower yet. So we really might not want a front row seat. I didn't listen and got one anyways, and oof, I regretted it. I'm sure it was a great talk and a treasured memory looking back, but at the time, all I could think about was how not to gag. This horrified my friend's daughter more than I thought, as she went, Ew, he smelled bad? I was sort of taken aback and said, Well, what do you think? Being around animals all day, every day. That day was worse than others, I'm sure, but come to think of it, he stunk pretty bad the other time I got close enough to smell him too. So did Bindi for that matter. My friend's daughter is apparently also very into spas and perfumes and smelling nice, and this has put a great damper on her thoughts of working with wildlife, and even her enthusiasm for seeing it through a screen. My friend called me the next day and said, Of all the things to share with her, did you really have to bring up how Steve Irwin smelled like monkey waste when you met him and distracted you from the talk? She said that seemed like an inappropriate thing to bring up and also disrespectful to Steve's memory. But I don't think it was inappropriate to bring it up. I think it's a realistic part of the work Steve did and was certainly something that stuck in my memory. If anything, it made me respect the work he did even more. Am I the jerk? Not the jerk. She's 13 for crying out loud. This isn't Santa Claus. Her world isn't going to end now that she knows animals can smell. Am I the jerk for telling my parents if they want to charge me rent, then they need to treat me like an adult? I, 18 female, recently just had my 18th birthday yesterday. It was nothing big. I just went on a shopping spree with my own money. When I came home, my mother and stepfather decided to sit me down and gave me a whole lecture on how I'm an adult now and I need to start paying rent because they weren't going to house adults for free. Even though my stepdad's 23-year-old son lives here for free, but that's besides the point. They told me that I would start paying $650 every first of the month starting on July 1st. I tried to bring up how my stepbrother doesn't pay anything and it was unfair to spring this on me when I just turned 18, but they responded that I must have the money since I went shopping today. Now, let me tell you, I pay for everything I have. Phone, my car, which isn't under any of their names, my clothes, and even the food I eat because they claim I eat too much even though I don't. So I agreed I would, but then since I was paying for everything I owned, they no longer could treat me like I'm a kid. Instead of them looking at me like I'm their kid or stepkid, I would be looked at as a tenant. They no longer could give me curfews, I would be disabling my Life360 and they no longer could just barge into my room because I pay for it and they no longer can demand anything from me besides rent on the first of every month. I also told them that if they couldn't follow my rules, since I'm paying rent, then I will go rent a room somewhere else. This started an argument, and they started yelling about how I'm disrespectful, and that this was their house, and they didn't have to follow any rules of mine. So, I just left. Now, I've been getting calls from family calling me ungrateful, and saying that my mother could kick me out. So, Reddit, am I the jerk? Edit, I just want to add this because a lot of people are asking if I'm still in school. I just graduated high school last month and I will be attending university in the fall. Since it's summertime, I do work full-time, 
but I'm not sure how university will affect that when the time comes. Another edit. Because people seem to think my parents are doing this because I have a bad spending habit. I don't. I've been saving money since I started working. Obviously, I haven't saved all my money because I still had to pay for my car, my phone, and food. But I saved enough to the point I'm getting myself through college with my own money, not my parents. Also, I'm allowed to treat myself for my 18th birthday. Good for you. Once rent is brought up to an 18-year-old by the parents, the dynamic changes. End of discussion. I hope you can get a place with some roommates in your area. Not the jerk. $650 for one room? Leave now. Cut contact. That is so disrespectful. OMG. Not the jerk. Just to be petty, before moving out, say that you want the same rent stepbrother pays. You two pay an equal amount as adults or you move. Just see what they say. Move out anyway, of course. Not the jerk. The accidental malicious compliance against world expert. This occurred back in the 70s, and before I start, I want to emphasize I was never stupid enough and will never be stupid enough to use my hidden talent. Background. I was taking an elective criminal forensic, CSI stuff, night course at a local community college. The best part about taking this course was the instructor, which meant an in-depth tour at the US criminal forensic lab where he worked as the question document examiner. Also, since computers were barely introduced into forensics at this time, all handwriting analysis and matching was done by hand, and this instructor was one of, if not the best, in the world. The malicious compliance, as good as I can remember. It was a great course studying many facets of criminal forensics and taking the amazing lab tour. As the course was coming to the end, the question document facet approached, the instructor's specialty. At the end of the class, just before it started, the instructor wrote a paragraph on the board and we each had two sheets of blank lined paper. He told us to write the paragraph, only the paragraph, any way we want on one sheet and then again on the other sheet, trying to disguise our handwriting. You are committing forgery. The instructor left and we all started writing. When done, one student, not me, collected all of the sheets, mixed them up and took them to the instructor. We all looked forward to the next class where the instructor would present matched sheets, then explain to us why our forgery attempts failed and how he would testify in court to prove it. Because I wanted to go home, I made it easy on myself. For my forgery attempt, I wrote the paragraph in print on one sheet and in cursive on the other sheet even though we were told that it's a failed way to disguise handwriting. Now for a little background on my handwriting. It's bad. I mean really bad. And I have held pencils and pens wrong since I learned to write. The easiest way to explain it is I write with a closed fist, right-handed. In elementary school, my parents hired a tutor to try to teach me how to write again from scratch, including putting plastic things on pencils to make my preferred grip uncomfortable. It failed miserably. In high school, I had a teacher tell me I would amount to nothing because I had issues writing legibly. Basically, my print is somewhat legible and my cursive, good luck. But that should make no difference. Now back to the story. At the beginning of the next class, the normal happy-go-lucky instructor looked very upset as he walked in. The first words out of his mouth was if anyone played a practical joke on him, he did not appreciate it. The whole class, about 15 students, looked at each other totally confused. The instructor then again tried to get someone to confess, but we all continued to look confused. The instructor calmed down a bit and decided to continue with the class as he would normally have done so. From the stack of papers he was handed at the end of the last class, he picked out the top two sheets and said, in court speak, how he deduced that the same person wrote both paragraphs. Then a student would admit it was their failed forgery attempt and the instructor would continue with the next two sheets. When there were just two sheets left, the instructor lifted them up for all of the class to see. Looking straight at me, he said, he could not testify in court saying the same person wrote both paragraphs. With a scared look on my face, I said both sheets were mine and I wrote both paragraphs. So in front of the instructor and the whole class, I again wrote the paragraph, once in print and once in cursive. The instructor walked away, shaking his head and mumbling something like he had never seen this before. After that, the instructor looked at and spoke to me differently as my classmates created some obvious nicknames for me. The Forger. I got an A in the class and I was very happy when it ended. Some questions. Exactly why I could do this, I have no idea. I figured if I was in school today, I would be diagnosed with some sort of minor learning disability. No, I cannot demonstrate this now. I have not written in cursive in 40 plus years and I'm too old to relearn. Cursive. Think loopy letters all connected together, which thankfully is being forgotten. I did make a new account for this post. 
In the 80s, I found a career that matched my handwriting skills. Computers. Edit. I saw some debate on whether this is actual malicious compliance. I thought it was in the realm, but if not, thanks to the admins for letting it stay up, even if I unintentionally strayed from the definition. Am I the jerk for having my sister-in-law and her two kids escorted away by security because she refused to RSVP? Last week was our daughter's 16th birthday. We decided to go all out on our party for a variety of reasons. This would include a private tour of a place she's wanted to go to and we rented out a room to have a catered dinner. This should all have been just a smooth ride, right? Enter my sister-in-law. My wife and her sister do not get along. They can keep up a casual relationship for the sake of family, but that's it. It doesn't help that my experiences with my sister-in-law have been incredibly dramatic. She's quick to play the victim and gaslight. Sister-in-law has two daughters who are practically best friends with my daughter, so obviously she wanted to invite them. One big issue with sister-in-law and her family is that when it comes to coordinating anything with them, they are unreliable on a good day and like trying to communicate with a blind deaf person who does not speak the same language as you on a bad day. They are never on time, sometimes hours, or in one case, a day late, and will not communicate at all if they're planning to show up. The thing I hate the most is that she will just text you randomly after an event started saying they decided not to come, or show up after they said they couldn't make it. Because my wife does not get along with her, I told her I would handle it. I sent two emails and three texts, and had a 20-minute phone call with my sister-in-law months ago telling her what we were doing for my daughter's birthday. Because of what we were planning, we needed to buy tickets for everyone and tell the caterers how many they were serving. I needed an RSVP as soon as humanly possible to organize this stuff. She either needed to be on time or tell me she could not make it. I told her if she ghosts me, there will be no tickets for her and her kids. She ghosted me. I didn't buy her and her kids tickets. Sister-in-law and her kids showed up, on time somehow, for the event. My wife was livid, so I handled the situation on my own and I told my sister-in-law and her kids they needed to leave because we didn't get tickets for them. If she wanted to join us for the tour, it would cost quite a bit to get new tickets, and the caterers do not allow alterations after a certain amount of time out from the event. At first, she tried to say she did RSVP with me, and then eventually started to shame me. Our guide called security, and in the end, she and her daughters were escorted away. The event was great, but my sister-in-law's entire family are blowing up at me and my wife. The event was two hours away from sister-in-law's home, and they say it was heartless of me to turn her away after the trip. Along with this, her daughters have now stopped talking to my daughter, telling her that I kicked them out of her party. I explained to my daughter the situation, and she called me a jerk. My wife has told me to ignore her family, and that daughter will realize we are not in the wrong. Not the jerk. You sent out emails, texts, and had a discussion over the phone about the RSVP. Sister-in-law is the jerk, and so is the rest of the family that's on her side. Not the jerk. Her daughters are going to end up just like her, acting entitled their whole entire lives. Your daughter may be upset with you right now, but one day she will realize why you had to do what you did. I'm 27 female. My fiancé, 27 male, wants more kids after we agreed to only have one. I, female, have been with my fiancé, male, since our second year of college. We've always had very similar life goals, very similar dreams and values. We both wanted to be married before 30, wanted to have successful careers before having kids, wanted to buy a house and settle down, and most importantly, we only wanted one kid. I grew up an only kid, and he grew up with siblings, who he has very bad relationships with now, so it was what we both wanted for a long time. We got engaged two years ago, but the universe threw us a curveball a few months after we got engaged when I found out I was pregnant. A complete accident. We were in a place in our lives where, apart from the wedding, this was a good time to have a kid. We both had steady jobs, a reliable income, transportation, etc. We decided to postpone the wedding until after our daughter was born. She was born in May of last year, and things were obviously hectic for a while while we adjusted to being parents. We hadn't really talked about having more kids at all, because I figured she was our one and done. We both absolutely adore her, but that hasn't changed my mind at all. In fact, it makes me more adamant that I only want one. Since he never brought up the topic, I didn't either, because we were very clear before she was born that we both wanted the same thing. The only time I can think of it coming up was a couple months ago. One of my friends told me that she was pregnant, and I was telling him about how sick she was, and I said, so glad I don't have to do that again, jokingly. He kind of laughed, but got really quiet, and when I asked him about it, he just said that he wasn't feeling well. Now, we are a few weeks away from getting married, 
and we decided to go out for dinner last night because we had barely seen each other lately with all of the preparations and parenting duties and such. We hired a babysitter and made a reservation, got dressed up, and went to a really nice restaurant. Dinner was going fine and we were having a really great time until he mentioned that he had something he wanted to talk to me about. He admitted that he wants more kids and I was initially shocked but asked him about it. Why did he feel this way? How long has he felt this way? And he replied vaguely, just kept talking in circles saying he just wants more. I asked if he wanted to leave the restaurant because it seemed like a more serious conversation but he was very persistent that we stay. He began talking about this dream he has of having lots of kids like six or more, and plenty of grandkids to be around when we're older, and big family dinners. It kind of shocked me, but I told him plainly that I did not want more kids. I couldn't imagine not having our daughter, but I also couldn't imagine having so many kids that I wouldn't feel like I'd have any time to give our daughter the attention she deserves growing up. I said simply I would not have more kids, and I thought we had agreed on that a long time ago. He said he had changed his mind, but then got up and left the restaurant, leaving the keys. He didn't come home that night, but in the morning he stopped by and grabbed some clothes, then asked me if I had reconsidered. I told him there was nothing to reconsider. We had agreed on this years ago, and he left without another word. It's been a day, and I haven't talked to him since, but he's texted me the address of the hotel and said I can stop by with the baby if I've changed my mind and want to talk about it. I don't really know what to do. He wants more kids, so he bailed on the kid he currently has? He's trying to manipulate you. That alone is enough to call off the wedding, but he also refuses sick days and nighttime wakings. Ugh. Honestly, I'd call him on his bluff and call off the wedding. He'll probably flip out. I've been thinking about this for an hour. Something ain't right. Where does this desire for six kids come from? How long has he been thinking about this? And now you can only discuss it if you've changed your mind? I really have to wonder if he's trying to end your relationship in a way that makes him not the bad guy. I feel like something else is going on. Either way, you don't want more kids. There's no compromise here. I'm really sorry. Am I the jerk for doing a chore when my wife asked and then not telling her about it for seven hours? So, I feel like one of us lacks perspective on this, so I'm hoping y'all can help. My parents are coming to visit us from another state on the 4th of July. I know this always causes my wife stress just because she wants the house to be spotless when we have people over. Towards the end, we already have a cleaning service scheduled to come in a few days to help get things clean enough so she isn't stressed out. You should also know we have a new puppy and this thing is in the stage of putting everything in its mouth. Now, normally we're kind of a bit cluttered. We have people over all the time and our most common solution to the clutter recently is throwing anything that's even a little unsightly into one of our front rooms. We normally just keep the door shut and well, out of sight, out of mind, right? Anyway, one of the items in there has been an artificial Christmas tree. For a couple months, we've talked about it a few times as something that we need to take care of. It was always, we need to take care of it. I know y'all don't know my house, but it's pretty difficult for a single person to get an object the size of an artificial tree into our attack. Anyway, yesterday my wife and I go out to eat. Before we order, my wife goes, can you just take care of that tree? I was like, sure, I will just need help getting it into the attic. Anyway, after some of the slowest service on record, it's actually pretty late when we're headed home, so I end up telling her I'm just going to have to handle the tree in the morning. Well, morning comes around, my wife reminds me that I said I would do the tree and then tells me she's going to be outside handling some things. So I get up, handle the tree solo, and clean up some dog mess, because of course. Anyway, then my wife comes in in a bad mood and I'm trying to cheer her up, but I decide not to mention the tree because, I don't know, it seemed like it would make her happier to find out later. Anyway, she just asked me about it, and I told her it was the first thing I did today, but she's mad. She says that she would have been doing other things in there if I had said something. Maybe I was the jerk. Sounds like she handles the mental load. If you knew there was a lot to be done, but only did one thing, you're the jerk. If you were just waiting for orders, you're the jerk. It's your house too. Help her clean without having instructions. You're an adult. Y'all need to be on the same page. Learn to do things without instructions. What has happened to this sub? This grown man needed to be reminded twice in a 12-hour period to put a Christmas tree in an attic in June. And then she had so little faith he would follow through, she felt she had to remind him again. His wife seems to be drowning in the mental load of this relationship. What I want to know is what was OP doing during that 7-hour period she thought he was doing nothing? What was the wife doing as well? I get the vibe only one of them was continuing to clean and prepare for that visit and I doubt it was OP.
You're the jerk. You knew there were other things to deal with in the front room, and you ignored them and only dealt with the tree. It's not your wife's responsibility to tell you what to do to maintain and prepare a house for guests. You live there. You have eyes. You presumably have critical thinking and reasoning skills. Learn about mental load and stop acting like your wife's junior employee. Reddit boy, didn't I tell you to take out the trash? Yeah, I did that hours ago. Well, you should have told me. Ugh, this mental load is driving me insane. Am I the jerk for telling my mom I'll never be happy she's doing better by her do-over family? My mom was not active in my life when I was young. She left it all to my dad. He was such a good dad too, and he did his best to make up for my mom never being around. They were married, by the way. She was married to her job, mostly, or always doing her own thing. Dad would try to bring us together, but she always had excuses. A year before he passed, I noticed he started to grow more frustrated with her. She had let us both down many times and they started arguing. The day he passed, he was in an accident, he stormed out of the house after mom accused him of trying to pawn me off on her and how she wasn't some cheap babysitter. After he passed, she was in a real weird place for a few months. I hardly saw her and spent most of my time at my uncle's house, my dad's best friend. She met someone new and dedicated a lot of time to him. I was 11 when dad passed, had turned 12 when she met her husband. It was obvious how different she was with her second husband. It was also obvious when she had kids with him that she was a more involved mom. She actually went with them to see Santa, took them places, made memories, all the stuff she never did with us or even me. I resent it, I'll be honest. Her husband noticed it before I moved out of their house and called me out on not being happy for my siblings and him. I told him he got everything my dad had begged for, that I would not be happy she let my dad pass unhappy, that she made me unhappy my whole childhood. He called me childish. I told him I don't give a hoot about his opinion or his happiness. I moved out before I graduated and before I even turned 18. I live with my uncle now. It was just better. Ever since, mom has been like, why don't you visit? Why don't you ever call? Why do you never answer texts? She texted me twice before that point in three months. She asked to meet last week, so I did since she was paying. She told me she was doing better by her family now and did not like that I carried such a clear grudge. She said she's doing everything with them to make sure they don't miss her like I did and I should be happy for her and for them. That she'd like to think my dad would be happy for her. I told her there's no way he would have been happy. She ignored the kid he had with her and did everything he wanted with me for other kids. I told her at the end of his life, dad probably didn't even love her anymore. Like she clearly never loved us. I told her I will never be happy that she's doing better with her do-over family. That she could take her pawning off and her cheap babysit herself and just stay away from me. She called me spiteful and said I should love my siblings enough to be glad for them at least. She also sent me a text over the weekend saying I'm just like she was and congratulations for being what I hate. Am I the jerk? Also, siblings is because I do not consider them that. They're her kids, but she's not really my mom, so they're not really my siblings. Not the jerk. She may be doing better by her new family, but what is she doing to make amends with you? She's simply trying to get you to give her a free pass. Try not to let this experience hurt the other areas of your life. Seek help if you need it and move on in a positive way. I'm 46, male. My conversations with my wife, who's also 46, are leaving me confused, exhausted, and downbeat. We've been married for 22 years. I feel that I have to be on guard at all times. Things can go smoothly, but if I'm not highly vigilant, I will say or do something that will devolve into a long and depressing conversation, leaving me confused, exhausted, and downbeat. For example, yesterday, things were going nicely for about two weeks. She comes into my office, I work from home, and I stop doing what I'm doing to listen to her. I'm smiling, I'm happy. She asks if I'm okay with her taking a bookcase from my office. I playfully reply, what will you offer me in exchange? She says this is manipulation. I say it's negotiation, still being playful, but starting to understand this will not end well. She ends up saying this is not a negotiation, she just needs an answer, yes or no. I move into a practical mode, say yes, and clarify that I will need to move my things, and we agree on a plan, and that's that. There's no real unpleasantness here, just a practical, neutral conversation. I'm fine. I understand that she did not want to be playful in this situation. I feel a little dumb, but I can move past that. But she doesn't. She starts asking me questions about if it's really okay that she takes the bookcase. Why did I say that in the beginning? Why I continued instead of just answering, and so on and so on. I tell her I understand that she wants to clarify the situation and I want to give her proper attention. 
but right now I have to work and I suggest that we continue this conversation at some other time. She says that's fair and leaves. Later on, as we're preparing dinner, I say, you had some questions for me. I'm ready to answer now. She starts asking, but it's entirely different from what she was asking before. Now it's about something other than if I'm really okay with giving the bookcase. It's about why I act the way I act. Like why I'm playful when she asks a practical yes or no question. And this is where, as I try to explain myself, things will devolve into a sort of psychoanalysis session. She was a nurse in mental health, where she will jump all over the place saying she's not judging me, criticizing me, or asking me to change, and then do exactly all those things. You have a gap in your thinking process. You should see that there's a human being in front of you. At many points during this four-hour conversation, I have to try to clarify what it is that she actually wants to know or accomplish, but I never get a clear answer. I try just listening. You're not participating in the conversation. I try explaining myself. You're justifying and not listening to me. I don't feel understood. I try empathizing. You're just repeating. I try to apologize. You're trying to avoid the subject. And all the while, I cannot get a clue of what's really going on and how I'm supposed to act as nothing that I do or say while being myself or trying to be an improved version of myself accomplishes anything. I truly want to see her happy and I'm willing to spend four hours talking with her, but the result is negative all around. I'm at a loss as to what I should do now. I went to bed at 9.30 p.m. and I got up at 9 a.m. feeling down, not wanting to see anyone, talk to anyone, or do anything. This is not the first time. I need to know what to do from here. I'm perfectly open to hearing that I'm 100% of the problem. I just need to know my next step. Individual and marriage counseling. Y'all aren't even remotely on the same wavelength. Do this next. Tap here on your screen to come see our new podcast playlist where you'll find thousands of hours of the best stories you've ever heard. Or tap the one on the right. That episode is specifically just for you based on other videos you've enjoyed the most.